What's going on, everybody? Patrick Connor here, and welcome back to the Knuckles and Gloves podcast. I'm here with my dude, Aris Pina, who is, of course, a fellow history guy, and that's what we're here to talk about today. Look, Eris, before we get started real quick, I was simply going to say there's a lot of shit going on in the world, and specifically in our country right now. So, I mean, I guess we're trying to, for a change, take a positive spin or whatever direction you fucking want to go, positive spin and try to talk about something slightly positive today and not wild and dark. So what's up, man? How you doing? Um, I'm here. <laughs> you know I mean? Wild and dark, wild and dark. Yeah, um, that's the best as I can put it. I'm here. It's certainly been an interesting week to say the least. And um, yeah, we're just here to talk about some good stuff in boxing though. You know what I mean? Like it's going to be kind of a quiet week, I guess. Well, quiet in the sense that there are big names fighting this weekend, but like there's not like names that, you know, they're not in like big name fights. I mean, you know, Boots Ennis is making his comeback, what, tomorrow on the zone? I believe. Yeah, right, isn't it tomorrow? Yeah. And normally everyone would be like, you know, excited for that. And for the sense, I guess people are because Boots is one of the rising stars in the sport and one of those guys that when he fights, you want to take notice. The only problem is he's fighting this guy in a rematch. That's kind of pointless. And one of those mandatories that get forced upon you. And um, so there's that. It's basically just a homecoming fight, but he's fighting against, what was that dude's name? Karen something. Yeah. And, Sh- Shukazian or. Yeah. I'm, I wasn't going to try to butcher his last name, but so yeah, the only thing about this is that it's just a, you know, a needless mandatory rematch, but it's just like a homecoming firm, but better yet, you know, Bam's on the undercard of that Bam Rodriguez. And same thing, it's not one of his more high profile fights, like him fighting, you know, Sonny Edwards or um uh um Francisco Estrada or anything like that, but you know, it's still these are two of the best fighters in the world and they're sharing the same card. So that's cool. Other than that, I mean, you know, Keyshawn Davis making a hometown thing today. It's kind of a more it's like a mild week, right? What what the kids call it mid. It's a it's a midweek for the for this for the sport for in terms of like action. But low riz, right? Yeah, low, low riz, yeah, right? yeah. So, is that what they're saying? Low riz. Is it? I don't know. No, I don't. I'm just embarrassing we're, myself. We're both in our 40s bad. now, bro, right? <laughs> so here we are. Um, but nah, yeah, we were gonna say today, like, you know, need to take a positive spin on things and stuff like that. And so, like, yes, there are parts of the positive things that have happened in the sport of boxing. One of the things that I guess make everybody in that we can all unify in terms of loving, right? Because all boxing fans are always divided on so many different things, even worse than politics. It's just the dumbest shit you can imagine. Whether you like a manager or certain fighters and this and that, factions, all this crap. There's, there's always so much division in one thing, right? But one thing we can all universally agree on in the sport that we all brings us and what we love about it is like emphatic victories, inspirational victories. Like dudes who just somehow you know, rise from the ashes, something happens where they got to go through some heavy shit and hell and back and they come back and win. And we all just like universally, you know, celebrate that afterwards instead of going back and bickering. I mean, the bickering starts again in less than like an hour after that, but at least for that moment in time, everyone's universally, you know, together, united. Right. And so that being said, that's what we want to talk about today is just like, you know, inspirational victories over the years. It's a giant sport that's been over the years and there's been many inspirational victories that's happened over there that like, even 60, 70 years on are still talked about with reverence because of just how incredible they were. It's not exactly that we try to avoid politics per se, because our politics I think are probably pretty like understandably well known at this point, but we don't really talk about them on the show unless we absolutely have to. And so point being whatever side of the spectrum, anyone might be falling on dude, it's been stressful. It's been a fucking stressful week, last couple weeks, whatever. And so it's it, that is something to easily unite behind or at the very least kind of uplift, you know, emotionally or whatever. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the fights that we're going to be mentioning today, that's that's what we're talking about. Like when what you're saying, the kinds of victories that are just, you know, get to your heart, pull on your heartstrings and that most people can agree are just like you know, emotional or whatever you want to call it. Sure. So, I mean, the, we're probably going to ha- go over a couple of bigger fights today, which is totally fine, but I'm sure that we're going to hit on a couple of smaller ones too. So what's, what's one that, that for you is something that like, you know, uh, a prime example of an inspiring victory. 
I mean, first off, it, you have to like discuss. There's always, you know, it, it, it's not a discussion that comes up often because like you can't really just like put one singular fight for it. But if you had to have a discussion, this one would certainly be in it, right? And it has to be like you know Duran's for uh, Duran Leonard won when Duran ended up winning that first fight. Like that's one of the greatest victories in boxing history. That's what I mean when that's that's like a tough discussion to have because how do you really <laughs> say this is the best one that's ever happened in boxing, right? So it's hard to really put the a singular one on that, but it's easy enough to like add ones to the to the conversation. And Duran Leonard one is certainly would be one of the higher ones up there. Like just everything about it, the the build up to the fight, you know, that was a, just that's an absolute true super fight. The first major super fight of that decade. And you know, the start off the eighties and you get that to the all time greats and just so much going into it, you know, the build up to the fight and then Duran with the insults and everything, like how he got under Leonard's skin by flipping off him and his wife and saying all kinds of other wild shit and just being basically Duran back then, you know, but then it was the performance in itself. Like Leonard was undefeated. He was bigger than Duran. He was faster than Duran, you know, supposedly stronger than Duran. And even though Duran was, had already proven himself to be one of the greatest lightweights who had ever lived up, you know, during his reign, this was still a monumental challenge fighting a champion at his absolute peak who wasn't trying to lose, had all the confidence in the world, and now is even more pissed off with the shit Duran was pulling on him. So it's like, for him to be able to pull that off, and it was just the way he fought, too, you know what I mean? Like, it's just an absolute brilliant performance because, yes, Leonard did end up fighting his fight, and that helped Duran's causes, but still, it's everything, like, you want to put in, and that was just, like, a perfect storm for him that night. When you kind of put it in perspective... I mean, we talked about Roberto Duran. We've talked about him on numerous shows because he's fun to talk about and he's a madman and had a fun career, long career, but that's what I'm about to mention. We talked about him on the kind of longest careers episode. And when you put that in pers into perspective, Roberto Duran won his first lightweight championship in 1972. Four fucking years before Ray Leonard Olympics. won gold in the Olympics. And that was four years before they fought. So, I mean, you're putting it, in, putting it into perspective, Roberto Duran had already been on the championship level for a solid eight years. And, you know, he, he himself was probably a little bit past his peak or pretty close to his peak physically or whatever, but as a welterweight was not remotely a large welterweight at all. Uh, Ray Leonard was definitely better suited, a little lankier, and considered just blinding, blindingly fast. Part of the kind of prepackaged promotional or marketing material on Leonard was during the Olympics. He already had, I believe, uh, Ray Jr. It was only Ray Jr. I think, but he might have had two kids by then. I'm not. I I don't remember specifically. Point is, I know he had at least one, and but that was kind of part of the. You know, he's a He's a father. He's he's a young father trying to kind of make it all work, and he's became quickly became a media darling after actually even before winning gold, and then winning gold just kind of was the cap on it, and that was one of the first times that really a star was born from the fucking beginning, and people watched his entire professional career unfold from the very beginning. Cause he was signed super early on and made his pro debut and just skyrocketed. And so, and, and on top of that, I think that, uh, you know, one, he already like retired even before he turned pro was the problem. He was like threatening to like not turn pro. He was such a weird indecisive guy, but nonetheless, you know, his story was, uh, it was a very well-known one and he was kind of like a media darling and all that type of shit. And like you said, very close to his prime, if not peak and Duran, I mean, it was a super close fight. I think a lot of people might kind of talk about it a little bit wrong and that they say like Duran dominated or something like that, that that was Absolutely not the case. Not. He Absolutely. had to fight his ass off in the last handful of rounds to get that win deserved the win, but really had to fight his ass off for it. And one of the judges scored fucking ten rounds, even. That was that was such a weird thing back then too. That like when, you know, it's almost 
it's definitely almost a, it's definitely a sin now basically that that when you do a 10 10 round like people criticize that shit in boxing it's almost unheard of because as they know for boxing judging especially like if you're being trained for boxing judging all that they always say just if anything always just find somebody to judge it for like try not to do 10 10 rounds because dumb muddle up scorecards like that can happen you can't be indecisive over 10 rounds what does that even mean It was a close fight, but yeah, no, for 10 rounds, no, you could have found a winner. Like an even round or two, great. Sure, sure. I get it. 10? Chill, Insane. come on. But, yeah, well, that was, it was not a romp for Durant. It was just one of those that he had to go through hell and back. Leonard definitely pushed him, and Leonard would have beaten anyone else again that night because Leonard was a great fighter and proved it that night, too. Because, you know what's, you know what's crazy is that like Leonard... For all this shit, like, the media, again, it's just a bunch of grizzled veterans and other ones, and they've always had a thing against pretty boys in boxing and guys who just, you know, the smiles and featured on television and all the glam and glory and yeah, all that. Fighters bullshit. who get that promotional push, they often get a lot of hate, too. Exactly, and Leonard got a lot of that, saying, oh, just wait till he gets pushed, wait till he fights somebody good, and da, 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 all, you know, how they were talking when he was coming up. Thing is, Leonard was fighting good competition coming up. He was not fighting, fighting cream puffs and buns and canes or whatever you want to call them coming up. Like, he was fighting legitimate fighters and, like, really tough ones, you know what I mean? Like, Floyd Sr. was a good fighter. Marcos Geraldo, very good fighter. Adolfo Virouette, very good fighter. Randy Shields, a very, very good fighter. Like, Andy Price, we blew out before he fought Benitez. Like, these were all, like, guys that a majority of these younger dudes today would not be fighting while they were moving up to fight for a championship, okay? Like, Leonard was not being coddled. But the media just, you know, the ones who had a vendetta against him acted like, same thing with De La Hoya or anyone else though back then. Like, they don't like you, they're going to come after you. That being said... Leonard was definitely, like, a hardened veteran at that point. I mean, he had gone through some really tough fights. Um, Geraldo, for instance, beat him up and, like, messed up his eyes. And I think was one of the, that was one of the precursors for when he ended up getting, like, damaged from that. was The start of it was from that fight. Um, you know, Dickie Eklund and others, like, just gave him, they gave him rounds. You know what I mean? Randy Shields gave everyone hell and gave Leonard hell in the fight that they had. Like, this was good seasoning for him. So by the time he fought Benitez, and I think, what, he fought nine times that year. In 79. Um, the, before he ended up challenging for the belt in uh, November of that year. And that's insane. And so he goes through Jesus, that. Yeah, and especially the names on there. That's I didn't realize it was that many. That's a lot. Yeah, right? I mean, I know two of them. Uh, Andy Price was right before Benitez. I'm not looking at box rec right now. And then Benitez. But, like, who else was that year? Fuck, dude. Adolfo Virouette. Okay, yeah. Pete Ranzani, Andy Price. Uh, Wilfred Benitez. I mean, you know, and and all of the kind of secondary names where a lot of those names were guys who were kind of like lower end, like maybe 10 to 15, top 10 to 15 or something like that in the division. Marco mm -hmm. Geraldo, Tony Javirini, you know, guys like that. Yeah, Bernadette Marcotte, right? Yeah, yeah Johnny Gant, guys who were kind of like, you know, maybe even 10 to 20. But nonetheless, you know, during all of, add those all up, that's fucking nine separate fights in 1979. You ain't seen anybody fight nine times a year and ever at this point. No. And, and, so, and don't get me wrong, because that's probably a good thing, but I'm just saying. Absolutely. Well, absolutely. Let me bring up Boxwick really quick because I got to look up. Obviously, Duran first moved up to welterweight before he fought Leonard. He didn't just move up there and fight him, you know, right away. But, um, sheesh. So many guys named Roberto Duran. <laughs> So we go back to, you know, Duran gives up the lightweight championship. And after um, stopping De Jesus around like, you know, 78, 79, he gives up the title, right? And by that time now, when he first moves up, the guy like, you know, Duran was looking good. Like some fight, he was always kind of like a hot and cold type dude too. Like, you know, he would always, if he needed to put it on, he would put it on. If he didn't need to, he didn't have to. So he went to the distance with a guy named Jimmy Hare who was one of those Midwestern dudes who had an incredibly, like, long record, but, and kind of awkward, but, I mean, Duran didn't look like a world beater in that fight, but he still looked okay. And it was, you know, when he fought Palomino in 79 on the undercard of Larry Holmes, Mike Weaver at MSG, he looked absolutely brilliant. That was one of his best performances, and when it comes down to his career, probably one of his more underrated ones because it doesn't get brought up that much in terms of his, like, spectrum. But, yeah, because it wasn't a title fight, yeah. 
Exactly. But then, you know, his next few fights after that, he doesn't look amazing either. He goes to distance. He goes to distance with Zephy Gonzalez, who was a very uh, an unheralded dude, but, you know, an awkward uh, slick fighter. And then he knocks out Joseph Nisboga and Wellington, um, Wellington Wheatley. So, yeah, it's a major fight against Leonard, but it's like one of those you still think Leonard is going to be the guy that's going to come ahead in that. But I mean, just. Duran was just brilliant from the first round to the last. And like you said, too, because everyone thinks that for the people, I think Duran was on a romp. Leonard was the one that was like really coming on the last rounds. Like Duran was finally decelerating and Leonard was the one that was like putting it on him. If I remember correctly. With who? I'm sorry. I said Leonard was the one coming on in the later rounds of that fight. In their first fight? Yeah. Yeah. Like I think that uh, Duran had kind of like built up a little bit of a lead and was kind of trying to hold on to it toward the end. And seemed like I think it was uh I think it was the last round where he was doing a lot of like playing a lot of defense and shit like that. And Leonard was kind of trying to furiously trying to mm -hmm. win rounds or whatever. Um yeah, it was a it was obviously a a great fight and a high level fight, but pretty damn close, especially for what a lot of people seem to kind of misremember. Sure. But think about that too, is that Duran is the only person to beat a peak a peak Sugar Ray Leonard. You know? When you count his other losses later on, when losing to Terry Norris and Hector Camacho, that doesn't really count. That wasn't Leonard at all. I was just a shell of a person that that once was. The man in 1980, at the peak of his powers, the one you would just see knocking Davy Boy Green's um, mouthpiece into the nosebleeds and just being on top of the world as the guy that succeeded Ali as the, you know the new superstar of boxing was not going to be beat by anybody. And he showed that subsequently... You know, in the rematch with Duran, how he pulled through against Hearns and before the eye injury, how he was just looking. But it's like that it's just an incredible win. You know what I mean? That whole it's just an absolutely incredible win. And that's like kind of Duran's career in a spectrum. Like, yeah, there's a lot to unfold and people are like, oh, yeah, no moss, no moss. Or, you know, him losing randomly to Robbie Sims or him losing this fight or that one getting blasted by Hearns, which everyone loves to bring up. But in between, you know, the the weirdness that was going on with, you know, some parts of his career, Duran had these signature either wins or performances that can't be matched by anybody. You know, the first fight against Leonard and then his crazy comeback in 82 to 83, where it like culminates with that shot against Hagler. And of all the Hagler title challengers, Duran came the closest to actually beating him. You know, which is incredible in itself, because just like a year before that, everyone was washing him up as just being he washed up and he should retire. And there he was, Gavin Hagler, who was so much more massive than him. That was another inspirational performance. So much more massive than he was and outboxed him for long stretches, you know, moved around him. And ha if Hagler didn't move and like really push on him those last rounds, he would have lost because that was a one point fight on all three cards. And that was the only person out of that whole out of all of Hagler's success of, uh, successful title defenses to push him that close. And then that's 83. Six years later, he's already been through like all kinds of ups and downs of his career again. He comes in and fights Iran Barkley and pulls in one of the most incredible performances you can imagine to win the title again. So just unbelievable guy. Yeah, and and especially, uh, and it, it kind of fits in with the theme that I'm going with the guy I'm about to talk to in a moment, a uh, talk about in a moment uh, as well, but just the, the idea of kind of bringing a win to a country, bringing a championship to a country and inspiration. Uh, it's not exactly like I, you actually kind of feel bad for a handful of the other fighters who were around at the same time who were from Panama because Roberto Duran was like overshadowing them. And there was already a, a fairly strong, uh, you know, list of fighters who were from Panama that were very good fighters. But Roberto Duran was such a hero there because of his victories that he, he overshadowed everybody, Pedrosa, you know, everybody basically. And, um, because of that too, that was just kind of like that extra burst of inspiration and motivation or whatever you want to call it for Roberto Duran, you know, b uh, becoming such a dominant lightweight champion and moving straight up to 147 pounds facing one of, you know, the best fighters in the sport and a guy who wound up becoming probably the greatest fighter of the 1980s, despite being retired for half of the fucking decade 
I mean, and I mean, that just goes to show you how good some of the wins that he had were during that fucking decade. Uh, and Roberto Duran defeated him. Yeah. I, and it's, and he beat him at his peak. Like this was, this wasn't like Leonard entering his prime early on or just wasn't really, you know, ready for the occasion or he was past his peak and kind of, you know, ready to be taken over. This was a guy at the absolute peak of his powers. No one was beating Sugar Ray Leonard at this point. You know, no one should have. And Duran, for one night, was able to put it together and showed his brilliance, like just absolute brilliant performance. And, you know, Leonard, to his credit, made sure that he got the rematch because he knew Duran was out partying and celebrating and not in the gym and nothing like that. Made sure that he got the rematch as quickly as possible, which was what, like June? Yeah, it was four or five months after. Because I think the fight was in the rematch was what, November? Yep. So, yeah. And... I mean, brilliant idea. Duran definitely had to go back in the gym and lose a fuck ton of weight, which he subsequently did. And just, he wasn't, you know, the thing about that fight too, is that that's another thing is that a lot of, I guess I would call them, a, you know, fans who just don't know would try to say that Leonard was clowning them and beating them and easily slapping them around before Duran just quit. That was a relatively close fight too, for the first, you know, as yeah. it was going. Leonard was more in control of it, clearly, than he was in the first fight. But that being said, it was still a close fight, and Duran was still putting paws on him, and, you know, there was still a long way to go. It was just after Leonard really started clowning around, and when he did that whole bow thing like that, and Duran did walk into it, like... <laughs> I sympathize, dude. I had an old, I have an older brother that's four and a half years older. Yeah. I know that feeling. <laughs> I know that fucking feeling, dog. But... And for a person that was so macho like Duran, I, you know that never happened to him in his life, clearly, right? So, like, being treated like that is just something, like, he had a... <laughs> yeah, well, and, and he's come up with... Uh, we won't get we won't dwell on it too too long, but he's come up with a number of excuses: stomach pains, he ate too much, drank too much, uh, lost too much weight, gained too much, et cetera. Regardless, or, or, or that, um, or that, that stupid shit that they did with, um, what, what was that thing? The 30 for 30? Remember the ESPN 30 for 30? And <laughs> they took, they took Leonard and Duran and put them in the ring together, like face to face. Yeah, dude, that poor Duran, that fool got ambushed, dude. He didn't know. He didn't realize that, and he and Ray Leonard was basically like talking him into a fucking corner. He was like, "Roberto, you gotta tell us what happened that night, just once and for all." And Duran's just kind of like, "What the fuck, really?" <laughs> He's like, "I thought we were coming here to like remember the." Yeah, man. <laughs> what a fucking goon! Come on, bro. They were really reaching with a lot of those 30 for 30 episodes back then with like the, the ways they were, you know, the best one they did because they didn't really, they didn't use any current foot like interviews or have some kind of thing was the Larry Holmes Ali one. Cause all they did was show archival footage and that made it nice. <laughs> well, yeah. And, and how many, there aren't too many more like angles on Muhammad Ali shit that we haven't already seen every so often they pull out something where I'm like, Oh, okay. I haven't seen that. It's not that often though. It's not sure. that fucking often. Like the last great thing that I can think of was the facing Ali that where they went and talked to his opponents. And I'm like, oh, okay, we're not hearing from Ali for one. I was watching that on YouTube the other day, and that was not to veer off, but that's just that's just sad to watch now because I think everybody from that, with the exception of Larry Holmes, has passed away. No, no, Chavalo. Chavalo. Yeah, well, yeah, I was gonna say Chavalo's. I think not in super great shape, but is yeah, uh, he's, he's definitely in a bad way. But yeah, he's still alive as well. Yeah, but yeah, um, but yeah, that because of that, they they caught it at the right time, I guess. You know, sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a fa if you've never seen it, if you're listening, never seen it. It's an absolutely fascinating documentary. They interviewed uh, Henry Cooper, Chavalo. I mean, almost anyone that was like relevant that had a chance that fought Ali during that time. I mean, Frazier was on it. Um, Foreman, oh, Foreman's still alive. There you go. He was another one that was interviewed on it. Uh, Ron Lyle, Leon Spinks, um, Norton, I think, was on it too. I'm sure. I, I don't think know. So, yeah. But like, it was just a, a, a host of his opponents. It's a really good documentary. So yeah, it's been it's been a while, and it's yeah. been a while since they've had anything really good. <laughs> but. Anyway, yeah, um, 
so super inspirational performance from Roberto Duran defeating Ray Leonard. And I think similarly, although it needless to say did not carry the same weight in terms of being such a great win and such a widespread pound for pound win or whatever. Uh, I think similarly, I wanted to talk about Alexis Arguello and his inspiration to Nicaragua for a handful of reasons. I'm not going to get into it like super deep because that's also calls for political discussion. And I don't want to go there, especially because that ain't that ain't my shit. And I don't want to like, you know, upset anybody. But I guess long story short, uh, in the mid to late 1970s, Nicaragua was going through a lot of political strife and change. Uh, and there was kind of like a revolution looming in the country. And so there was a lot of just split opinion, a lot of turmoil, etc. And so Alexis Arguello managed to I'm not going to say that he like you know fixed all the fucking problems in his country because he did not and also on top of that I think that not long after winning the championship I think he moved to Miami but there was you know for pretty good reason that being said in 1974 and the anniversary of that's coming up and later on this month he defeated Ruben Olivares at the forum I believe in Inglewood and that wound up being a massive win in the sense that, first of all, Olivares, one of the greatest featherweights of all time, uh, you know, one of the greatest Mexican fighters of all time. And then on top of that, just a, a hard hitting guy, a pretty tough guy, a very good fighter. And Arguello had lost his first title bid against Ernesto, Ernesto Marcel, himself a very, very good fighter. Um and Arguello, I think, was seen as kind of like a middling, weaker kind of guy, possible contender. And he stepped in and destroyed Olivares in the later rounds. That uh, in and of itself, he kind of also took a slight political stance in the wake of that win. And I think for that reason and the win itself, the bringing a championship to the country and whatnot, very inspirational. Oh, no doubt about it. Aguero was one for his people. And not only that, he he always promoted it. Like that was one of his things is that like he was just like when it came for the neck when it came to Nicaragua and it came for what he meant to his people and what the people meant to him, like it was just absolutely genuine. Everything with Aguero was really genuine. That's what made him like such a popular guy, is that he was just in a sport full of, filled with just absolute scumbags and thievery and this and that and just all kinds of shit Arguello stuck out no I don't want to say a, a sore thumb because that's not like the right that's not the right wording it's just like he just he just stuck out because he was just you know a breath of fresh air in a sport that's usually just filled with bile and but you saw it though with the passion that he had with when he would you know carry the country of Nicaragua and talk about how you know what it meant to him to be their champion and all that and was he he was their first world champion correct yeah yeah so right away, right there, I mean, becoming the country's first world champion will obviously make you a national hero. But um, I know he did say, I think, I don't remember what fight it was. It might have been the Bazooka Limon fight where he wore the flag of the Sandinistas. I believe it was the Sandinista army. And that's what started like the strife in terms of like the controversy of him and his country over that. And um, because the Sandinistas, you know, obviously... Well, that's not like we said, you weren't really going into it. I'm not I'm not gonna touch on it too crazy either, but like the Sandinistas and the Contras, that was like what was going on in the and the strife over there. My dad actually in the eighties, I don't know if you knew this, went to Nicaragua to go document it. Remember you tell me about that shit, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he went down there with a group to go document it and you know, bring supplies and stuff like that. And he just hung in the villages and hung with like, you know, he said he had dozens of kids following him around every day while he would photograph them and Yeah like that and then, like i asked him it was a oh. massive humanitarian crisis because sure. of what was going on with like the aid and you know the yeah, financially with yeah. the country so he was down there hanging and you know doing photographs and taking things or whatever and like i just asked him one time not to veer off too much like what were these kids asking for and he was like honestly things like pencils like things to write on like you know paper like shit like that just like stuff they can just do you know what i mean that can like write and all that it was 
he said it was the most humbling experience he ever did, and he's glad that he that he was able to go out there and do what he did. But back to Arguello, um, yeah, that's that was like the main thing with him. Like I know that brought a lot of controversy with him, and like you know, subsequently, uh, a lot of issues within the country. But he always still just maintained his love for Nicaragua, regardless. You know what I mean? Like, and for instance, I'll give you an example of one thing I always found pretty cool is that. It wasn't, it, this actually didn't play out like this in real time, but HBO edited it to make it look like this, and it was pretty fucking fascinating, is that when you're watching the um, Legendary Nights with Arguello and Aaron Pryor, and um, they were talking, you know, they're talking about the fight, and they start doing the intro of Arguello, and they did it while he's walking to the ring, and they had the, and they showed a clip of the um, singers singing the, Nicar uh, the national anthem in Nicaragua. And they made it seem like Aguero was walking into that while they had the three, you know, the two beautiful women and the guy in the middle singing, singing the shit. And it just looks amazing as they edited that together. Like, that's not how it went out. Aguero was clearly in the ring listening to it while they were singing that. But like the way they had it come down there, he had his head down going and they were singing that thing. It was really, really cool. And it just kind of gives you a, like a, you know, a visualization of like what it meant to be that guy. Like he was an absolute national treasure. You know what I mean? And Everything he did, he just always... The thing about it, too, what's made him the best about Aguayo is that he always just made it in a classy way. Like, he wasn't bringing, like, trash to his country. Not in a way like Duran, who would always be controversial in some ways, saying after, for instance, saying after he fought Ray Lampkin, he was going to kill him. Or no, he's not saying that. If he was felt better, he would have sent him to the morgue or, like, yeah. trying to spit on somebody and doing some shit. Arguello instead was going over and after knocking out Ray Mancini, patting him on the head and kissing his dad on the cheek and saying, like, I'm sorry I had to beat your kid up, but, like, you know... I love you guys. <laughs> Things like that. You know what I mean? Endearing themselves to like TV audiences all over the world just because he was a classy guy. But you just knew he wasn't putting on an act and that's what made it so special. Like that was just genuinely him. Yeah. And he was a, a supremely likable guy and that was kind of the, that was the tagline for him or whatever was that he yeah. was extremely likable. But then the fight started and like, he was going to kill you. <laughs> he sure. was going to fucking hurt you. And I mean, th there was the, the thing also about Arguello was that he could sometimes be a hot and cold kind of fighter. Cause you look on his record and he has a handful of losses kind of here and there that are kind of like, where'd that come from? You know, like you're, you're looking at it and you're like, what happened there? You know, like why, what or draws or something like that. And you, he could kind of run hot and cold, but generally speaking, you know, he was dangerous. He was lanky, very, very good jab, really good right hand, but also an educated left hand too. Um, but yeah, I think that it was, um, there was a lot of bullshit going on in his country. A lot of it, un unfortunately, like a lot of things in Central America, the U.S. got their fucking grubby paws around, uh, you know, on what was going on and had a lot to do with the political bullshit and strife happening in their country. But yeah, unfortunately, Arguello kind of got roped into that as well. And his career, um, at least on the surface, suffered for it too. There were a number of like Sports Illustrated articles and articles also in boxing magazines that talked about it a little bit. And he did talk about that... Um, for instance, his stuff got seized by the government. Um, and so it's at some point he was basically like, I can never go back to my country, at least not the way it is right now, because, you know, I'll fucking get killed, you know, if I go back. And like you said, it's like there's a lot of complex bullshit going on uh, to, to get into. It would be literally its own fucking show at this point. But that being said, um, yeah, he at least for a, a period of time, especially in the kind of mid 1970s and going into the 1980s, was a bit of a uniting force for a lot of Nicaraguans. Sure. Then the same thing happened to Dick Tiger. Like when Dick Tiger joined uh, the Biafran Front or like, you know, Biafra, he saw, he got into like a lot of turmoil back home. Yes. Well, because the. Long story short, and I'm not, I don't, I, I'm leaving out like a ton, obviously, and I'm not, and I'm also not an expert, but long story short, um, Biafra was like a, a number of people 
had kind of band banded together and wanted to kind of make a independent country uh um off a portion of Nigeria and basically had tried to do so and claimed independence but then the Nigerian like the I think it was a military led Nigerian uh uh I I don't know if it was like a theocracy or whatever was going on but point is they like crushed them and uh, Biafra ceased to exist after only like a couple of years and stuff like that. And the people who were supporting were a lot of them were either put to death or in, imprisoned or whatever. And so Dick Tiger, yeah, was in a pretty hairy situation himself because he had joined the Biafran army. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's getting, we're just sitting here talking about, we're not going to get political. We're, we're, inspirational yay i mean um, it is inspirational for these guys to stand for what they're going to do over there you know what i mean it's just sad but the, they end up getting trucked and the yeah, thing and about they wanted being kind of pawns unfortunately yeah yeah and that's the same thing too with our goya was that after his career ended so he loses twice to prior and never doesn't you know he doesn't really recover after that i think this last fight before he retired the first time was against a uh, former champion Billy Costello, and this is like 1986. And Arguello was definitely past his best at this point. Even just he's been a, like again, you know, his, his first world title against Ruben Olivares was 12 years before that, and he was a pro before that too. Like he's been around for a long, long time, and he's just shop worn. And it showed it in that fight because Costello was a good fighter, but I mean not a like an, a great fighter, but a very good fighter from back then was outboxing him and making him look slow and everything until Arguello. The last thing you lose. Um, as a fighter is your power, right? And Arguello lands that boom, boom, the classic one, two that he did, went right through Costello's guard, knocked him out. And, you know, Arguello rode off into the sunset. But then he had another weird comeback into the mid nineties where you, you know, in your stack of ring and KO magazines, I'm sure it's been talked about a little bit, but Arguello decided to make a comeback, had a couple of fights, um, talked about saying, who do you think inspired that Harris? Foreman. Cool. <laughs> of course, that's who yeah. that's who inspired a whole fucking host of like 1970s fucking past their. I was just dudes. thinking like there might have been some other like you know like lower weight fighter that came back because I thought Foreman just kind of you know made all all of his heavyweight buddies do it, but nah. <laughs> I think he inspired a lot of fucking fighters, yeah. And sadly enough, too, which really stinks, but you know you got to call it the Foreman effect. A lot of these guys, the last thing they needed was to take another punch to the head, and. It just kind of exasperated their injuries, like Jerry Quarry, Jimmy Young, others. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. I was gonna say Quarry is probably one of the most glaring and worst fucking examples of fighting way too long and just who fucking let this happen type of things. I mean, it's crazy to think, you know. So the other day, the uh, I don't know if it was yesterday or so, the Kovalev Hopkins was its anniversary, right? That's today. Yeah, it's today. Okay. I was there actually. I was working that fight. Um, just thinking back on it, but Hopkins was like what a month or two shy of his fiftieth birthday. Yeah, if it was like forty eight or forty nine or whatever it was. Like, yeah, oh, forty nine, right? Jerry, let's pick, put this in perspective. Jerry Corey was fifty or so when he died of his brain damage that he had. You know, I don't. I mean, I'm not trying to like weird. I don't. I don't know. It's just like it's just crazy to think like how young he was when he ended yeah. up passing away. Yeah, but well, and the way it, it there is no formula, you know what I mean? Like, there's obviously yeah, a guy like Jake LaMotta lives almost to a 100. It doesn't, excuse me, it doesn't make sense, you know. It, but yeah, some of those guys just that was the last thing they needed, absolutely. But Arguello ends up losing, you know. Thank God for him that it wasn't like a bad loss, he got knocked out really bad or anything where I got embarrassed. No. You know, he got he got out boxed by a dude who could not punch by a guy named Scott Pinkcat Walker. If there was anybody he was going to lose to, thank God it was a guy like that because he didn't get hurt. He just lost. Who cares? So he loses that fight. But that's sad afterwards is that like the same country that he's always loved and he's, you know, trying to do right by and everything like that. Kind of. I don't again, I'm not going to go into detail because I don't know enough. There's been just so many different stories and innuendos about it and all that. But like kind of subsequently led to his eventually passing yeah. with, you know, his depression and all the stress he was going through with it because i know he became mayor of what mayor managua i believe so yeah but there was just so much behind the scenes shit that was going on with him and again i'm not going to try to sit here and discuss it because i don't i, I just don't know enough 
you know? But that being said, I do know a lot of that stuff definitely contributed to like his mental health and not in a good way. I I personally would say that, uh, and this might be something that makes people mad, but I feel as though Alexis Arguello's death was fishier than probably Arturo Gotti's. Could be right. I, and I mean, but that being said, I do also think that we probably overlook far too much the type of damage and the type of mental health damage and issues that getting hit in the head constantly does to people. Sure. And, you know, we've, we've read not to get too dark, but we've done other episodes where we've talked about, you know, true crime shit and stuff like that, where other fighters have talked about constant headaches and wanting them to end and stuff like that. And, yeah. you know, anyway, long story short, that obviously wound up being a very sad end for our way. and, Suspect. That, was a, sad, that was a sad year in general. What an awful oh, bro, that was like the awful, ter worst fucking summer. It was like it was like a span of like three weeks or something like that too. It was like yeah, with Gotti, Arguello, and then um, uh, Vernon Forest. Vernon Forest. Yeah. That was so. What the fuck? Yeah, that that was wild, and that was an awful end for Arguello. But even all the way up until his death, I mean, anybody. You ask basically anybody who met him, uh, they liked him. They thought he was a super nice guy. People at the Hall of Fame, you know, people he would uh, every so often would show up to fights, especially around like Miami. You co-hosted, like guest hosted on on ESPN a few times during fights. Se seemed like a super good, super nice guy. I mean, he was the nicest guy on the planet. I've I had a ch I was lucky enough to meet him several times over the years. And, you know, talk to him a little bit and all that. And just most wonderful dude. Like, it was just a genuine guy. He wasn't putting on an act. He wasn't like fucking Hulk Hogan or anybody like that where, you know, they shake your hand, but they don't want anything to do with you. He was there. He was engaging. He would talk to you. You know, if you asked him something about his career, he would candidly talk about it. Just was happy to be around and to be remembered and enjoy that because he was just a gentleman. That's the best way you could put it. He was an absolute gentleman, you know. And... um the other gift that he gave us too, we have to say, I mean, not to say that he wouldn't have come along if it wasn't for Arguello, but you know, he, he was the one behind Chocolatito. And that's early a great days. point. That's a really yeah. fucking great point. You know, like that was almost like his last gift, his last gift to the boxing world. No, that's a really great point. And like you said, it's not as if like, uh, Ramon Gonzalez not, wouldn't have become a great fighter without him, but I, I would imagine he was very instrumental. I know he was his mentor very early on. Um, and I mean, and that's also something that a lot of people just don't even, they don't realize or maybe forget is how far back Chocolatito goes. And by the time, you know, most of the people who are boxing fans and not super hardcore boxing fans, by the time you heard about him, that fool was already like 12 years deep into his fucking pro career, bro. And he had already been a champion for a number of years. So like, I, and I know that like, you know, it was like straw weight, so it doesn't matter to you, but Nonetheless, the guy was a fucking technical marvel going way, way back. It's not his fault that he was born fucking, you know, four foot six and 91 pounds. That's not his fucking fault, bro. You know, but nonetheless, uh, yes, no question. Alexis Arguello is instrumental in helping inspire Chocolatito himself. Yeah, I think the from what I read somewhere is that Arguello was looking for someone to like kind of mentor and all that and went through and he was the only one that felt he was worthy of was Chocolatito and look where it came. Cause I remember what, I mean, I was already reading about that just because of the Arguello rub. Like, I don't think Roman Gonzalez was going to get that type of press if it wasn't like, you know, okay, I'm being aligned by Alexis fucking Arguello. And that certainly helped. And that's why he was getting some early press. Yo, Arguello got this little tank that's walking around just destroying things. And then by the time he fought Nita for the championship in, uh, what year was that? Oh, seven or something when he first became champ. Gosh. Yeah. I want to say, Oh six, oh seven, something around there, yeah, something like that. And Nita was a good fighter, you uh, you talk Nita, and he was a guy that was a former champion, had retired, then came back and won the title again. It was still young and a very good champion, a very good fighter. And Gonzalez destroyed him, just absolutely destroyed him. And then, well, that just was the start of what we know today. Him and you know, first ballot Hall of Famer, all time great. 
and in the discussion for being the greatest in Nicaragua. I know there's a lot of people on Twitter who are absolutely in love with Gonzalez that be like, yeah, yeah, he's better than Arguello. I am I'm not going to say that because I, I just at, can't. At least not running away. Like, yeah. sure, it's an argument, but it's, for me, it's not like clearly, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely not. You know what I mean? So, but that I'm being... going with Mayorga anyway. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, all that being said, it's just like, yeah, Arguello, that's that's a great point to bring him up. It was just one of those guys that not only an inspiration to his country, an inspiration all over the world because he was just a classy guy that brought a lot of class to the sport and people just wanted to like watch him and be happy. You know, when you sat there and watched him, you just felt like, you were sitting there, I don't know, you almost made it like you were going to invite your wife to watch it, and she'd be like, oh, this isn't like, you know, so just like, oh my gosh, so um, brutal and mean, and there's a guy spitting on somebody and saying he was going to send him to the morgue. Here we are saying, you know, my class, and this guy saying, oh man, I love his father, and blah, 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 and she'll get invested into that type of backstory or some shit, you know what I mean? It's like, it's like that painter Bob Ross, except for yeah. if Bob Ross painted like fucking gothic landscapes because because arguello was just destroying motherfuckers when he could but he was nice about it yeah extremely nice. and then all of his opponents would say the same thing i don't think there's one bad person that had to say a bad word about arguello not one opponent at all they all loved him yeah but, for sure so another one that um you know i wanted to bring up and it's interesting too because it kind of relates to news that just happened this week us being combat sports nerds i'm sure you heard about the news of um the George Hackenschmidt footage being unearthed, right? That's crazy. Yeah. So for those who don't know, George Hackenschmidt was one of the first world champion wrestlers and like an absolute superstar back way over a hundred years ago. And he, I don't, I guess this is, this is the first footage of him ever being seen. Is that what's happening now? To my knowledge. Yeah. And it was yeah. like, there's been none, none, none. And then all of a sudden there's like a 20 minute clip. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's kind of what happened. So this clip is from 1908, and it was unearthed against him against like Joe Stretcher or something like that, the American champion. But anyways, this is incredible stuff. Like for what this for what, for what this is for wrestling historians and combat sports historians, and you know even me as a boxing historian, whatever. Like this is incredible stuff to find. You know, just being a history nerd, I eat this stuff up. So what I'm getting at is that it gives me hope that some boxing footage that's not a hundred years old. I mean, it's getting there actually. Fuck. It is a hundred years old. Now thinking about it, like the Greb fights are at least, but still, you know, like it, it still gives you hope that certain fights one day could be on earth. So what I'm getting that is a one day I'm hoping the second fight between Willie Pep and Sandy Sadler gets on earth because by all accounts, that is one of the most inspirational fights in history and Pep's greatest performance. Yeah, dude, uh, there's, um, there've been, that's like one of the, one of the fights. Cause there've been a number of fights over the years. Like you said, uh, Harry Greb is probably the prime example because Harry Greb is kind of like the, uh, cross section of fucking greatness. You know what I mean? Because he's probably the greatest fighter. Mm -hmm. of which we have no real fucking footage but his resume is so good and so stacked that it's like the vast majority of history kind of people it's like you can't deny that based on his resume alone he's one of the top few fighters ever and so to not have footage is fucking wild and then especially now, like you said, with the Hackensch the Hackenschmidt uh footage being unearthed, it's like, you know, going back to the you know, the early twentieth century when catch wrestling was really starting to kind of take hold. I mean, we're I don't want to go into I'd love to go into fucking history, but but it's too much. And on top of that, it we would be it's it's its own show, its own podcast. Somebody else already does that. But, um, you know, going back and stuff like that, and like you said, similarly, think about how far back now, 75, 80 years, Pep and Sadler goes back and how long that kind of footage would have to be preserved for 
man. And, and, and the level of those fighters too, we do at least have some, or at least had some Sandy Sadler footage and Willie Pep footage. So we have a pretty good idea of what they looked like and what kind of fighters they were, et cetera. But that, and also at least longer clips or more clips of the fights between Tony Zale and Rocky Graziano from roughly around the same time. I can't, it's, it's wild that we're missing those clips and it would be fucking awesome to finally unearth some shit like that. Yeah. I know there's various reasons why you can't find certain fights. Like, you know, there's, there's footage of Jack Johnson, Tommy Burns, but there's nothing of like slapsy Maxi Rosenblum, for example. Right. And that people are just, it doesn't make, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make any sense, but then considering how many times he fought, it's like, how is that? What? Yeah. Well, fuck, like 330 incredible. times or something. Seriously. And you would think that like at least one of those times something was filmed somewhere, and it probably yeah, was awesome. when you think about it. But I know there was like a lot of issues, I guess, with the filming and other stuff that was going on back then that stuff just got lost to history or wasn't even filmed or whatever might have happened. And unfortunately, it was some of the greatest fights you can imagine. Like the first two Zell Graziano fights are not they're not filmed like and when I say I mean like um What's what's the word I'm thinking of? Like professionally filmed. That's the word. Yeah, they're not they're not professionally filmed. There's like weird grainy footage. It looks like from the bleachers of their second fight that if you like squint, you can kind of make it out. But it's nothing that's gonna make you be like, oh my god, you know what I mean? Yeah. But even then, with that little grainy ass footage from the high from the high angle, you can still almost get a sense of the violence going on in it because like, it looks like it's like violent, you know, the shit moving around pretty crazily. But there's absolutely nothing of Pep Sadler too, and it sucks because. By all accounts, everything, everyone that's been there, that read about, that's read, that's written about it, talked about it, all the accounts have said that it was the most brilliant performance you could have ever seen in a ring that night. And the fact that Pep was able to pull that off and then still had to go through hell at the end of it because Sadler was still, you know, Sadler like rained on after he got like, so Pep was out boxing him for the long stretch of the fight, just putting on the most brilliant display, doing, pulling every trick he ever, he ever had out of his book. You know what I mean? And this dude had a lot of tricks. He was what sixty two and one. He was sixty two and zero before he lost to Sandy and got the lightweight champion for the very first for his first loss. Then he ran off another like seventy something wins, seventy two fights before he ran in the before he ran into Sadler. And so he had like an astonishing record of. I'm not good at math. What would that be? <laughs> Gosh, yeah, he was like uh, something like hundred and twenty eight and one or <laughs> something like that. I I think that's what it was, but it was something like two hundred twenty five and one, something like that. Yeah, something absolutely ridiculous. And don't get me wrong, a lot of those guys, if you look at box rec and some of those records, you're just kind of like, oh, well, I can see why he was just going through the ringer. But still, he was an incredible fighter. So by the time he lost to Sadler for the first time, that was a big upset. And I mean, Sadler him. whooped the shit out of him. Yeah. And a lot of people thought that like Pep threw it because of how like thoroughly he got the shit kicked out of him. They were just kind of like, that can't be real. Pep's not losing like that. You know what I mean? And... No, nah, that was just a monster was on the scene, the the likes the world had never seen before at that point. Like Sadler was just a different type of freak. He was bigger than any other featherweight most had seen. Um, but not only that, he was just stronger. He was just a gangly giant with this freakish mean. Strength. Yes. One of the meanest men to the point of on probably being on the verge of a sociopath when it really comes down to it. Like he just enjoyed hurting people. And he enjoyed doing as he fouled you and shit. Like, he wasn't being clean all the time. He would lace you, hit you in the kidneys, elbow you. He didn't give a fuck. Like, whatever he had to do to get through the win, he would do it. Plus, he was a murderous puncher on top of that. So it was just a nightmare to fight that guy. It was not going to ever be a fun night. Never a fun night at the office with him. And he was a he had a ridiculous steel chin. So it was like, what are you going to do, you know? He got knocked out, I think, in what? Like, his, first, his second pro fight or something was never stopped again after that. So, anyways... He got, what, four rounds and Sadler just treated him like a chew toy. Just threw him around and beat the absolute dog shit out of him. Like you said, just whooped him. But in this rematch, I mean, you know, held at, it was at MSG, I believe, and like held before a massive crowd and Pep just put on the performance of a lifetime. You know what I mean? Like there's photos that you've seen of it. And it's interesting too, because for a guy that's a defensive genius, the way Pep's attacking Sadler, you, it, he's wide open, it looks like. Because he's doing like the double arm thing, almost like when you think one of those guys that just do like the, the double punch, like you've seen Ta like um, Pacquiao and others do sometimes. Because yeah. you'll see photos of Sadler clearly weary as he's like, weary, you know, 
moving back and stuff and his mouth's open and his eyes look a little glassy and you see a guy like pep and you see pep coming up and like this with his double hand you know what i'm talking about yeah and he's just there with his hands stared up and he has the two hands and he's about to like you know just go on a wild fisting thing and everyone said that it was one of the most brilliant displays that you have ever seen like it was inspirational to watch because sadler so much bigger than him stronger than him clearly had his number in that first fight it was just bedazzled by pep like pep had to do that but he put so much energy into that that you know what I mean? It's like when you fight the perfect fight, kind of like um, Meldrick Taylor against Chavez in that first fight, you still take it punishment because the guy you're fighting is still stronger than you, is still you know guy still coming at you and still landing even though he's not landing with the crate with the frequency he wants to, but he's still landing right. And Pep was still landing on him. It's doing it enough that by the not Pep by Sadler for instance was still landing enough that by you know it's getting to the later rounds. Pep is starting to bleed now and he's bleeding heavily over both eyes and he's getting weary and he's smaller and all that moving is starting to catch up to him because he's moving more than even, even he's more acclimated to and Sadler who's been getting whooped up the whole fight and smacked around, but he hasn't really been hurt necessarily is now starting to like really put the pressure on him and like knowing he's losing is really starting to pull the tricks on him too. And Pep has to do everything he can in his, in his system to survive that round, like to survive the fight. All he has to do now is survive. If he survives, he wins. But it's like a race against the clock and like there's an hourglass ticking on him, you know? It, yeah, just like basically a, a, a mad dash from Sadler and the, well, an inspirational victory from Pep yeah. to be able to come back from being destroyed like that. And also kind of the start. I mean, I guess the first fight was technically the start of their rivalry, but the fact that Pep was able to come back and win in the second fight, I mean, otherwise there wouldn't have been a rivalry. It would have just been Sadler destroying him and had his number, which is yeah. in itself pretty crazy, especially considering, you know, uh, Sadler kind of did have his number, but Pep is definitely thought of, generally speaking, as the better featherweight. But that being said, Sadler was also uh, a tremendous 130 pounder too. Definitely one of the best ever. And so, and, and got a lot of his work done at 130 pounds himself, but mm. I mean, fuck, he can't even imagine how the guy was making 126. You know, 126, 130, sometimes dabbling around 135. If he was around today, I mean, I guess he could make 126, but even look, I'm looking at a photo of it right now. He's pure muscle. His back is huge. His legs aren't really skinny like that either. Like it's just, you know, he's lanky, but it's all pure muscle. And like you said, he was just a nasty, nasty fighter with a ridiculous knockout ratio that took that relished in beating dudes up. Like it was a lot of fighters that complained about like they did about Larry Holmes. And I don't know if Holmes was doing that on purpose. You know, the way he would flick his jab out there, I can see the thumb just kind of getting in your eye. Now, Sadler was intentionally trying to thumb your shit out. He didn't give a fuck or lace you, <laughs> you know? Yeah, that was not even so much of a thumb as an elbow, forearm, yeah palm heal ya, fucking lace ya. he was doing anything he could and then there's of course the legendary it was the fourth fight between them right the legendary fourth fight yeah. where they're like wrestling and fucking you know like that's like all of the photos of that fight are of them wrestling on the fucking canvas like every single fucking photo and when you're watching that too it's hilarious because like well i mean it's not hilarious but it's crazy to think i think pep was the one that got suspended like indefinitely right and, and on top of that, the hilarious part was that not only did they get suspended, but I think Pep uh, in particular got suspended in like, uh, I think it was in Pennsylvania. And then like a, a bunch of other states followed suit and he wound up having to go back to, I think, Connecticut or something like that to fight because a bunch of other states were like, get the fuck out of here. You guys are crazy. Which That's is cool. considering how far back that is. It's wild that there was that much cooperation between the state, the state entities. There isn't now. Not like that, but in any case, yeah, pretty fucking crazy. You know, it's, and then Pep still went on to, like, he never regained the titles again, but, like, he still went on to have a remarkable career. Like, at that point, he still, you know, lost a little bit more, and there was other guys coming up, and whatever it may be, but, like, there was, you know, he still had moments of brilliance where you were just kind of like, oh, shit, for instance, in a fight he did lose, way, way, way past his best, he fought a non-title fight with um, featherweight champion, and I want to say the first uh, first champion from Ghana, um, Hogan Kid Basay, right? Mm -hmm. Basay Basay, and um, 
for long stretches in that fight, Pep was showing the brilliance of old. Like he wasn't as quick as he was back in the day, but he still like, you know, had enough wits about him that he was out boxing to say who was kind of, you know, not a guy that was like as quick footed as him or anything like that for long periods of time. It was just that he was so old. Eventually, you know, the pressure caught up to him and he ended up getting stopped. But like, those were, that's the thing was that Pep was legitimately an all-time great to think about the brilliance that he was able to show while not having a massive punch because he didn't score that many knockouts in his career is just like incredible. And, um, he, he was another one I wish I could have met. Like he was a guy that was always at the hall of fame every year and a personable per and a personable, um, fighter who would interact with every fan, you know, was always there trying to just interact, do whatever he could volunteering for different things. Whenever Sadler would be there, they would always like, in, you know, get together and, you know, um, revisit their rivalry and stuff like that. And Sadler definitely had fallen on harder times than Pep had in terms of their post-fight careers. Like, you know, Sadler had eye issues and um, neurological neurological issues that hit him before Pep did and such. But um, there were times like if you're watching them at the Hall of Fame, there's like a video of them from like 1990. And um, Sadler gets on stage to talk, but you can clearly see he's struggling. And then Pep comes up to join him and kind of help him. You know what I mean? And uh, they, you know, I'm talking about, go ahead. No, no, I was going to say with that, I, that totally tracks because Pep was fucking, at least he sounded super sharp until, you know, pretty old. Yeah. So that's what happened is that like Pep was, um, he would go up and like kind of help him and articulate. And then he like kind of, he would kind of lead it. He like, he would lead the conversation and stuff like that. And he was like, you know, Sandy, everyone wants to know who was the toughest guy you ever fought, the best one, blah, 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 blah. And then Sandy was like, well, you were pretty good. And then he was like, ah, and the crowd laughed and stuff like that. <laughs> you know, but yeah, like you said, Pep did last a long time before eventually dementia did set in for him too at one point, like it almost does for all these greats, unfortunately, it seems. But yeah, I wanted to bring that fight up. That was just one of those fights that's like, that was apparently his best performance. And of course, you know, one of the greatest fighters of all time and everyone's top 10, if not their top five and his best performance is not filmed. No, that's a, that's a pretty good one too, especially cause uh, yeah, like uh, kind of priming it with the Hackenschmidt thing is was a good idea because that shit is pretty fucking cool. That's big, big news in the world of wrestling history um, especially because there's such a lack of footage, uh, from certain areas in wrestling history and in boxing history too, but in wrestling histories so that like, we can't even really get an idea of how much on the level some of these matches were and whether or not some of the uh, wrestlers from back in the day, like, were they true shooters or were they not like, we don't fucking know, et cetera. And similarly, you know, it would be cool to have footage of a lot of these fights. Um, but one, one fighter we have, you know, a ton of footage for, and I felt like we couldn't talk about this. We've already mentioned him on the show, but we couldn't not talk about George Foreman's second run at a championship. If you're talking about inspirational wins for better and worse, like we've already mentioned, um, but not only his victory over Michael Moore, which the anniversary just fucking happened, but also uh, his first or his fight against Evander Holyfield, the first time he challenged for the heavyweight championship in his kind of second portion of his career, which did not go exactly how a lot of people thought it would. And itself was, I think, quite an inspirational victory. And that was roughly around the time that you really started to see a number of other former fighters come back because they said, oh, shit, it's not just a joke. It's not just some sort of fucking gimmick. And on top of that, he just made a shitload of money and they sold a shitload of pay-per-views. So in any case, uh, the second leg of George Foreman's career as heavyweight champion, that has to be up there. Oh, by far, man. That was, like you said, one of the most inspirational things anyone had ever seen in sports in general, not just boxing. That just transcended into sports. But the thing that makes it crazy, too, is that what initially happened, and for a number of years, up until basically the Holyfield fight, it was just looked upon as a joke. Like, no one took Foreman seriously. You know, when he first decided to come back in 1987, initially saying that he wanted to come back to raise money for his churches, and then also saying that 
becoming heavyweight champion would be the goal to like give like you know these kids inspiration and whatever it may be no one took him serious right like when he first came back he did look a little out of shape like yes he was massive and thick but he still just looked a little doughy as they called it right and his first his first number of fights were against just a bunch of like non-entities and like you know random areas of like florida and here and there and stuff like that and whatever it may be like no one just was like whatever you know and so he looked like anybody else. Okay, Foreman's back, but we're not going to take this seriously. Like, he's not going to fight Mike Tyson. He's not going to fight, hell, he's not going to fight guys like, who else was around, you know, Tim Witherspoon or Bone Crusher or any of these type of dudes. Like, he's just going to, you know, let him play, you know, play along, all right? And and they thought eventually he would just fade away because no one's going to, like, really take this, right? Yeah, he's going to get a name and he might get, a you know, some television dates and everything, but, like, eventually this will just go. And so he's picking on, like, you know, um club fighters and journeymen and then eventually starts picking on smaller light heavyweight former champions guys like Dwight Cowie who actually gave him a number of good rounds it was hitting him quite frequently and not really good performance caused that a guy that small was able to hit him around like that or another guy like JB Williamson and you know Bobby Crabtree and all these other guys like this is what this is what Foreman's feasting on right and it wasn't up until I would say you know the late 80s around 89 that Foreman started like you know making a push like actually starting fighting like more alive bodies and but 1990 was that proverbial shift in like perception like people still like it wasn't just lol anymore it was kind of like oh well maybe he does have something here but still skeptical about it you know what I mean and it's the two fights the two main fights he had in 1990 that proved that the first one against Jerry Cooney so that was more like a freak show than anything about that too, because like Cooney had been out of the year, out of the ring for a number of years. His career clearly never recovered after the Larry Holmes fight because he never really fought consistently after that. After the first Holmes fight, which was one of the biggest fights in boxing history in itself, um, Cooney took a couple of years off. Like, you know, he was just dealing with the fall off of that and like telling everybody he was sorry over and over and over. I felt like he had, you know, had America give American. It was just really stupid and fucked up what he had to go through. But Every time he attempted to make a comeback, it just kind of like stopped, stopped before it started, right? He beat a guy like Philip Brown. He would beat a guy like Eddie Gregg, and then he would just kind of go off. And then he fights Michael Spinks randomly in 1987 and got absolutely demolished in that fight. So when he comes back in 1990, yeah, it's kind of just like a curiosity freak fight. Like, okay, sure, put it on pay-per-view, but like you got a guy who's been out of the ring for a number of years, even though he's younger, and a guy who's been active, but he's older and fat, and no one really knows what to think of this. But then Foreman, I mean, one of the scariest knockouts of that decade, just, it was absurd how he knocked him out, you know? And, you know, you see they're shaking your head about it, so I already know, like, you're just thinking, it was a nasty knockout. <laughs> yeah, and that was, I mean, thank goodness Jerry Cooney seems to be okay for the most part these days, but, man, he ate it in that yeah. fight. And and actually, the funny thing is, uh, it was only a fucking two-round fight, but Cooney cracked Foreman a couple times, like more than you'd think. And on top of that, Foreman, like I remember uh, the next day he made a, an appearance on like Jay Leno or something like that. Dude, his his eye was fucking purple. Like he caught a good one. And he it's tough to say with George Foreman because he's like given so many answers for many things over the years. Like, and he's, he's a very good self-promoter. So he kind of just like, you know, kind of like how you said with Sadler and Pep, like whoever is in his presence, that was the best fighter he fought. You know what I'm saying? So like he gives, he's given different answers, but he has said a couple of times that Cooney hit him harder than a lot of opponents that he's ever faced. And so anyway, long story short, it didn't matter because he, that walk off kind of hook fucking uppercut was disgusting disgusting yeah george was fat but i mean like he wasn't like me fat he was like fucking look at his arms bro during his comeback that dude's arms were fucking massive huge and, and, and he was like, 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 yeah there was like no technique or he's just like like just fucking swinging his fucking arm dude jesus christ a sledgehammer and you just see by the way that dudes are fucking and everybody says it. Everybody who ever fought George Foreman, like, yeah, even the fights he didn't fucking win, dude. They were like, it didn't even matter. It it didn't matter if he was like swinging back. He's using technique, anything. You just can't don't get hit by him. 
because his punches are so heavy. I mean, it's absurd, bro. Like, he was hurt. He was hurt in that fight in the first round. There's a clip of it. If you watch near the end of the first round, Foreman swings. Cooney counters him with a hook and a nasty hook. And Foreman clearly, like, like he he goes off balance, but he's, like, hurt by it, too. And so, like, you know, his off balance is even more exasperated by that. You see him, like, just almost – he doesn't almost go down, but, like, he's clearly, like, rocked a little bit. And then Cooney lands a couple of follow-up shots, but that's about it. But, like, yeah, that walk-off shot that he did, he just walks up, dink, 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 boom, boom, and just – like, he's taking out the trash. It literally looks like he's throwing out the trash and just it's an uppercut that he hits him with. And you hear Alex Wallow and the other announcer, oh, oh, and, you know, Cooney just dropped like a lump of coal. But it was that fight. And then fast forward to the summer of 1990 now, and George Foreman has been clamoring for a fight with Mike Tyson. Now, Mike Tyson, who beforehand, when he was champion, I don't think the fight was really being discussed like that because, you know, there was other guys out there like Holyfield or whatever, but like, now that he's not champion anymore and they're looking for a big high profile fight potentially before Holyfield comes through or whatever it may be. Well, then actually, I think no, Buster Douglas was still champion, right? Because the Holyfield fight didn't at that point didn't happen till November. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, because it was February 90 was Douglas yeah. Tyson and it wasn't until yeah, months later. November. So it was, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, Tyson had already come back at that point. This was his first comeback fight in the summer. And Foreman was on the undercard of that with the intention of them potentially fighting one day, Foreman and Tyson. And, um, fuck, I'm over here losing my voice. So as that fight was, as you know, that was the thing Don King was all about at first too, because he was the promoter of that event, co-promoter, because Don was Bob Arum was, you know, representing Foreman. But at that point, Don King was very open and keen to having Tyson fight Foreman because he thought Foreman was still just going to be like a you know an old flash in the pan that Tyson would be able to feast on and make masses amount massive amount of millions of dollars doing it. But that night, Foreman for the first time fought a ranked contender, like a top ten contender, a guy named Al- Adelson Rodriguez, who uh, just recently passed away. Rest in peace. But um, Rodriguez was a very good fighter, a tough guy, guy clearly that wasn't going to make it at the very top of the division, but. You know, was a really tough guy. And then when he got knocked out by Evander Holyfield, gave Holyfield a nice little fight before he got knocked out. You know, it was a vicious knockout, but, you know, he was in there rumbling. So when he fought Foreman, and Foreman just comes off to the same thing. It's just the casualness of his punches. You know what I mean? And they're talking about it. Round one, Foreman just shoving him off, shoving him off, throwing. Rodriguez, so much, was not a small guy himself, but so much smaller than Foreman. (laughs) It's like just being bounced off. He keeps on charging at him and trying to land, but he's like hitting a water bag practically. Foreman shoves him off. This is like Foreman back in the 70s, except a little bit slower. Boom, 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 boom. And then Leonard, Sugar Ray Leonard, who was one of the commentators that night for HBO, made a comment about um, how relaxed Foreman always is and that he doesn't have to like throw in massive, like, you know, torque because of just how heavy his punches are. And that's how he knocks him out. He just walked up, bink, bink. And then you see Rodriguez, poor guy, just and lay there his eyes squig squagged all over the fucking way and it was a nasty knockout so nasty in fact that don king was just like you know what we're good on we're good on a tyson fight now (laughs) yeah mike tyson was uh fighting tillman on the on the gosh i don't even i guess he would as yeah, he would have been the main fight. Yeah, so Mike Tyson was fighting uh, Henry Tillman, and Tillman was the one who kept him out of the Olympics. And so that was the kind of like the storyline behind that fight. What And then there was, you know, kind of rumblings or whatever of George Foreman potentially being on the come up. But he wasn't really, like you said, he wasn't really fighting too many ranked contenders at that point. And Adelson Rodriguez had kind of floated in and out of the top 10 of the heavyweights. And so handling Adelson Rodriguez, like you said, Evander Holyfield already had, and that itself was a fucking nasty knockout too. That was like in, contorted in a weird position and shit. And then Adelson Rodriguez himself, he was a pretty decent fighter and you don't really see a whole ton of Brazilian heavyweights. And so he had a, a lot of uh, push behind him uh, in a lot of fans in Brazil. And when George Foreman handled him, yeah, like you said, it was kind of a wake up call. Like he was for real. Um, but Don King didn't really want a whole lot to do with that. And so because Mike Tyson then went and got in with 
uh, Razor Ruddock. And then that became its whole thing because of the con- the controversy with the stoppage of the first fight. And that kind of tied my, and I think in an injury too, tied Mike Tyson up for a little bit. And I think Ruddock got sick or some shit. Anyway, long story short, back to Foreman. <laughs> they wound up having to fucking figure out some shit to do with him. And because like we've talked about on previous shows, George Foreman was kind of shopping around promotionally uh, during his comeback. And then this kind of figures into the election we just had with Foreman Holyfield and where it was staged and all the type of shit financially that went on behind the scenes and all that type of stuff with it. But long story short, they wound up coming up with the money and they wound up staging the fight. And not only did it do gangbusters in terms of selling and getting both fighters paid, like I paid a tremendous amount, but also on top of that, uh, it was a lot more competitive than a lot of people thought it would be because of the nature of Evander Holyfield's victory over Buster Douglas. And yeah, he'd had a couple of wars and a couple of difficult fights. Sure. But on top of that, you know, a lot of people, like you said, just were not really taking Foreman seriously. And that changed that. Absolutely did. So by the time Holyfield ends up fighting Foreman, that was a massive fight. Like it was the one of the first fights um being distributed. It was the first fight distributed on TVKO, yep. um, HBO's pay-per-view arm. And it broke just records all over the place. And then it come without a share of controversy. Donald Trump, for instance, our new president. Um not yet, but soon. Awesome. Uh he cool. Yeah. <laughs> I know he pulled some shenanigans. Like, didn't he try to do something about? Um, well, the the Gulf the Gulf War was going on at that. I point. mean, you almost got to admire it. Like, you almost got to fucking just marvel at it. Really, yeah. The Gulf well, War well, was, had exactly, just the Gulf fucking started. Was going on, and he didn't want to pay up the. And money there was a war clause. Money. Yeah, that's what it was. Some kind of war clause saying he couldn't pay them what they what they what they initially asked for, right? Yeah, and yeah, exactly. And so it wound up being a fraction of what it was supposed to be. And a bunch of other people took a total fucking bath, at, yeah. you know. <laughs> and these motherfuckers didn't learn since 91. I mean, even before years and years and years before anyone, uh, before he was even thought of becoming president, if you talked about him in certain boxes, <laughs> like, what a fucking idiot that guy is. <laughs> but whatever, I'm not going to get into that. The fight itself. Foreman really showed himself because a lot of people didn't. They were always asking. They were like, do you think he was going to last the distance? That was the running joke. No one thought Foreman was going to go more than five rounds or six before he was going to gas out and Holyfield was going to, you know, eat him up or something. But there he was, trudging along, taking, you know, throwing combinations, landing, being really active each round, hanging in there with Holyfield. And then you had round seven, which one was one of the best rounds. A very, very underrated round now because it doesn't get talked about as much over the years in terms of like fighting for his life. That was an incredible round. First off, in the beginning of that round, Foreman came out there inspired and started bouncing Holyfield around the ring with his combinations. Like, you know, they're slow and ponderous and clubbing, but they're still accurate. And like, if he hits you, you get stunned enough that he's going to be able to be, that you're not going to get out of the way of it quick enough for him to like, you know, land one of those other shits again because he's coming away for the other side. You know what I mean? And yeah, you might be able to move and you're going to try to take it, but you just, he still moves you. Like, he's so strong, he's going to move you into his other side where he's going to club you. Up. Yeah. And that's what he was essentially doing to Holyfield. He wasn't like landing cleanly to his face, but landing enough that Holyfield was getting skedaddled from one side to the other. <laughs> and he was landing good combinations, but that was one of the um, first instances, well, definitely the one of the first instances at heavyweight where you saw Holyfield in his, you know, um, and his uh, reserve power because he's getting knocked around by Foreman and Foreman's gaining, you know, momentum and gaining confidence and like thinking he might be able to knock this guy out. And then that's when Holyfield spurts back with a combination, which was the hooks. Remember the left hook and then the rarely seen right hook where he just went Ursh, bow, 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 like over Foreman's cross arm and just hit it with like four or five clean ones over and over and over. And then you see Foreman's body shaking while he's Yeah, getting... all of a sudden you see big-ass Foreman like, uh, like yeah. you're like, oh shit, he's getting through. And I'm just like, oh my God, this is an incredible round. But I mean, like Foreman was with him the whole way. He lasted until the 12th and that in itself was like really incredible. And that gave him instant credibility, you know, because that, that was a twofold. It gave him instant credibility and it made people look down on Holyfield a little bit. Oh, he couldn't knock out old George Foreman. Oh, he got knocked around by him. See that? Foreman was landing on him. Blah, blah, blah. And then only like 
two fights later, his next fight, he gets knocked down by Burt Cooper and almost loses that. And then he looks like shit against Larry Holmes. So yeah, Holyfield in his first title reign was not like, you know, going on good momentum. There was a lot of hate going on back there. But um, still, you know, you move on from that. And when it looks like there's like, because his, his career, I mean, like Foreman's career after that, like it wasn't, it didn't have the same momentum in terms of activity because now he's so popular and now he's that going to be an HBO fighter uh, more or less instead of just doing the bar. Now stuff. he doesn't need to build up to that anymore. He yeah, just has exactly. the opportunities. Yeah. So, you know, his fights kind of become more few and far in between. Yeah. He's knocking out weird guys like uh, Jimmy Ellis, not the former heavyweight champion. Or, you know, poor Pierre Coatser. But, like, um, I say poor Pierre Coatser because that record he had to go through. In six months, he had to fight Riddick Bow, Frank Bruno, and then Foreman. Never That's, the same. Never. No, I mean, yes, probably his life has never been the same. So, anyways, but it looked like, you know, things were people started clamoring for his retirement again. And this is what makes the Michael Moore fight so remarkable. People start clamoring for his retirement after the Axel, uh, Axel, after the um, Alex Stewart fight. Foreman takes a nasty beating in that fight. He wins it barely, but his face looks like he was hit with a tire iron 45 times. Like both of his eyes are basically swollen shut, broken nose, jaw, you know, puffy, head puffy. Like he looks absolutely whooped, you know. And he's an old guy, too. He's like 42 or 43 in that fight. And it really did not help that Alex Stewart was like kind of unheralded. You know, like people yeah. were not. That was a guy he was supposed to knock out or something. You know what I mean? And then he wound up getting beaten up. So it was like, oh, shit. And Stewart had been knocked out a number of times at that point. Like he had been used on HBO as that type of dude. Like Holyfield had knocked him out. Tyson had knocked him out. Michael Moore had knocked him out. Like, you know, that's what he was known for as a guy that was beat up the lower yeah, he'd round. give a good effort but get knocked out yeah exactly yeah but the fact that foreman dropped him twice early on it looked like he was on his way to handle him the way the west of them west the rest of them did but then letting stewart come back and just bounce combination after ponderous combination because stewart was not a very fast fighter and you know kind of and not very um imaginative with his combinations like what you saw is what you get with him you know what i mean but there he was boom 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 and foreman just stutter. And then after that, losing to Tommy Morrison, it looks like it's going to be the end of him. But then here we go. Because of his name, he gets this fight with Michael Moore. He he basically made, you know, for some rounds, made Tommy Morrison look like that motherfucker was Ray Leonard, dude. Like, or, or Ray Robbins, Ray, any sort of Ray. Ray Lampkin. He fucking looked like fucking any Ray, bro. Like Ray Seals, whatever. Yeah, any fucking Ray. He looked like fucking... Yeah, I mean, you know, and it's not like Tommy Morrison was a bad fighter whatsoever, but he was he was rightly scared to death of getting hit by anything clean in that fight. And uh, you know, yeah, it especially after that, because Tommy Morrison had already been destroyed. And so people were like, Well, then if Foreman can't take out this dude who's already been destroyed and everybody thinks has a fucking weak chin then, you know, it's time to call it a day. But nah, man, he's George Foreman. He still had plenty of opportunity. Uh, and, you know, when Michael Moore had uh, risen to the top of the division, I don't know what exactly, you know, what mechanism precisely put propelled Foreman to the top of the fucking heap. Probably money, I guess. But Foreman was offered that shot. Of course he took it. Because he said, like you like you said, toward the beginning of his comeback, he said that his ultimate goal was to win a heavyweight championship. Nobody really thought he could do it. The Holyfield fight changed the idea that, shit, maybe he really can. But then it kind of wavered because of his struggles, etc. But then he got finally this last opportunity. You know, this, this was it. This was fucking, you know, last chance saloon and shit for this guy. And there's Teddy Atlas getting in his face and yelling at him at the pre-fight press conference. Luckily, he didn't get fucking buried right then and there. You know, make me a He's sandwich. so lucky. Yeah, exactly. Sit down and make me a sandwich. <laughs> and he said it with like, not he wasn't even mad. He's just sitting there smiling, going, sit down and make me a sandwich. It's he wasn't like, even looking at him when he did it. He was staring at him. I'd get bad him. too if I were Teddy Atlas. <laughs> What an idiot. But yeah, you know, he gets this one final chance. Uh, rightly, you know, few people think that he can do it. And the fight played out as if he shouldn't have. But he did. You know, Foreman had his moments in the fight. Like, there's been, I saw a lot of people on Twitter saying that 
Foreman was taking, I saw someone describe it as an Ali Holmes beating, which was not even close in the sense of that. Like Foreman was competitive. Have you seen Holly Holmes? I'm saying, yeah. Like <laughs> Holly like couldn't or, move. Or like Larry Lewis, Holmes. Or I heard Louis Marciano and other stuff like that. And it's like, dog, like, it's not it wasn't that bad of a beating. Sure, was Foreman getting lumped up? Yes. Was he losing almost every round? Yes, he was losing the majority of the rounds. But he was landing here and there. He wasn't getting totally outclassed and like he was, you know, it wasn't the holy. It definitely wasn't the foreman of '91 when he fought Holyfield, and he had definitely slowed up. But like, he was still just, you know, he still had, he still had that competitive uh, fighting spirit, as opposed to the other walking corpses. Like, he still had competitive spirit. And then when round ten happened, I remember as a kid, I still remember it to this day how it just like this seemed like a shift in him, where he was coming out and he was landing a little bit, and Mora was, you know, like wavering and. I think getting complacent because all the other rounds have gone the way they did that. He wasn't expecting to come with Foreman to come with a little bit more energy the way he did in that round. And, you know, he's coming in and he's landing a little bit and still it's wild. He threw three hooks in a row that was so sloppy and two of them missed. But, like, he was just getting there and getting there and having a really good 10th round. But then when those last two combinations happened, you know, the first one, dink, dink, and then you see more just, like, stand there yeah, still. Yeah, like, he kind of got frozen up just for a and second. And he admitted that afterwards, too, that he said he was essentially knocked out on his feet from that first combination, like he was just gone. And then forming that second one, again, with the most lifeless-looking punches you can imagine, but still, they're so strong because it just comes from him, just tink, tink, and the guy just... Yeah. To this day, bro, when I post shit about that on the Boxing History page, or I talk about it, or see other people saying shit about it, a lot of people, and I mean a lot, think that it was fixed, Call it fake, a fake mm-hmm. knockout. Michael, you know, Michael Moore could have gotten up. I don't think those people know a fucking thing about boxing or have ever been punched in the face in their entire life, even with a glove. Sure. Uh, and not by fucking George Foreman. I'll tell you that much. I mean, Michael Moore had already been banked up by a number of other fighters. He had been hurt by Holyfield, you know, hurt by Cooper. Hurt, yeah, dude, he'd been hurt in a number of other fights. He like went to war at light heavyweight. He had an, an entertaining light heavyweight run, kind of an overrated light heavyweight run, but an entertaining one. But nonetheless, you know, it, he was not like some invincible guy. He was getting through a lot of these fights at heavyweight by outworking uh, and, and, you know, using his southpaw advantage, as it were. And George Foreman had to fucking go through some punishment for sure. But that was the thing, dude. He lined his ass up. He lined his ass up, and you only need to make one mistake, even against an old George Foreman. He made the mistake, got hit with the right hand, and that was it, dude. And still, you know, <laughs> lamp. It happened. It yeah. happened. Trying so hard. That was that was his one. He got it that time. All right, we'll give him that one. But that was about it. But even so, you know, I remember that shit. That shit's uh, definitely a pretty vivid memory for me. It's what definitely one of those, if you're a boxing fan, one of those things where you remember where you were when you watched it type of thing. And uh, extremely and inspiring. And the audience, too. That audience. I mean, you know the thing that also helps that Lampley call it happen and happen is just everything that happened around, around that part, right? So he yells, it happened. It happened immediately as he says that Foreman just looks up to the sky. His eyes look up, right, and then he gets then he gets down and kneels down in prayer. That even that enhances it so much more. Yeah, you know, it it made it like the the producers didn't even need to do anything. They just everybody just put their fucking hands up and was like, let it play, let it well, fucking go. That's how it was supposed to be. And I brought this up on the show before until our um the uh, the announcer, Dale Gil Clancy, who was, you know, covering for Foreman, obviously, got in the ring and he goes, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. And this is initially when Foreman gets down in prayer, Lampley stops talking, everyone stops, right? And then you just hear Clancy, I can't believe it. Here's a guy I thought was a clubber. Uh, uh. And then he stops talking because I guarantee you some producer was like, shut the fuck up. Stop talking. Because he was just going to, this is a clubber and a guy I didn't think, but just, just let it go. Shut the fuck up. Yeah. It was playing out perfectly. It really did. 
And I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't write it better. You know what I'm saying? Like it was, it was clearly, and on top of that, it was the lineal heavyweight championship. It wasn't some sort of, you know, sideshow type of thing. Like had he had won against Tommy Morrison and they were kind of promoting that as like a heavyweight championship fight when the WBO had not gotten there yet. So, you know, yeah, it's massive moment. It's fucking huge. It was. I mean, it's kind of sad that for everyone was so excited about a heavyweight championship reign of Foreman again and the possibilities of it, it ended up the way it did. You know, Crawford Grimsley, Lou Savarese. <laughs> yeah, like the, the hind end of that was not good. It really wasn't because there was this excitement of a like potential fight for him. Like people were like, oh, he might fight Holyfield in a rematch. What he's got? Well, he, he was supposed to fight Michael Moore in a rematch. That one was even, they made the announcement. I remember. I, man, don't you miss Jay Seclow? The dude who <laughs> the full cards on. Fuck yeah. He had one of he had one of them full cards at anime at, at, at MSG from on HBO. And one of the things they did beforehand, they had an announcement, which I don't remember being aired, where they had Foreman and Moore appear in the ring and saying they were gonna have their rematch at MSG for the heavyweight championship. And that was on, one of the things I appreciated most about that dude is he'd upload the entire broadcast. So sure, there was shit that I didn't fucking because when we were tape trading, you had to fucking like save all the space you could and jam shit into a fucking two hours or whatever. So you'd have to cut off the pre fight or the you know whatever. So a lot of the shit that I remember watching and all that type of stuff was not the full program. Exactly, exactly, and that's yeah, I don't I mean, remember that at all. But so there was that. There was you know obviously the potential of a Tyson fight, Lennox Lewis. Holyfield rematch, uh, Galata. Like, there was all these guys that you were just like, ooh, you know, man, Foreman maybe. For, even Larry Holmes, for that matter, when that fight was going to get scheduled in 99 or something. Yep. But instead, look, we got Foreman fighting Axel Schultz in a fight he should have lost. And that gave us Schultz for, like, four more years in fights that we didn't ask for. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just what a weird error that ended up becoming. Like, I every after I, because of Foreman... There was like three more fights of Schultz fighting for the IBF championship in and Germany. And Savarese and Grimsley, for that matter, yeah. too, dude. Crawford Grimsley, they put in against Jimmy Thunder to get fucking murdered in like two and a half seconds. Savarese, also undefeated at the time, put mm -hmm. in to get fucking murked against a few fighters, too. Fuck. Yeah, so, I mean, who knows what would have happened if Foreman had beaten Briggs. He probably would have fought again. Who knows? Like, probably because he didn't look bad in that fight, but... Where was he to go? What was he to do? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, not a, nothing if he wasn't going to face any of the other other guys. And at that point, too, it was at that point that I don't even think anyone else cared about the leniency of the the, the you know of the yeah, title the lineage. lineage. Yeah, you kind of fucked yeah. it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know, just like whatever. Yeah, because when you call Shannon Briggs the lineal heavyweight champion, people get mad. It's like exactly. I don't know. Well, he almost messed up the lineage to the point that guys like Lennox and everyone else were just concentrating on each other instead of being like, ah, Foreman's just out there, whatever. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and so, like, well, and, like, just like I started off saying, dude, for better and for worse, uh, when we've talked about this on other shows, I think I've applied it to Mayweather a number of times, too, even though not recently, obviously, because he's not been a factor in boxing like that. But when a fighter becomes such an attraction or a gravitational force that it's like other fighters in their division are putting plans on hold and not doing shit because they might get that fight, that's not good. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's good for that fighter. It's good that they have become popular enough, and it's good that, you know, that fighter is making that kind of money and all that type of shit. But at the same time, if other fighters are putting their careers on hold for this type of thing and waiting for the payday, that's essentially kind of what was happening. And thankfully we still got big fights during that time between the other fight top fighters in the heavyweight division. And they weren't just waiting for George Foreman, but still, you know, with the lineage that kind of made it murky and messy for a minute. Thankfully Lennox Lewis lined it all back up by defeating Briggs. And then he should have defeated Holyfield, you know, in the first fight, but in any case, yeah, it all it all worked out, thankfully. Yeah. You know, I brought remember I sent you that thing yesterday or the day before or so where the Ring magazine did a ranking of the 50 best heavyweights in history back in 1998 and Lennox was ranked 26th on that list that like below Cleveland Williams and a bunch of other guys. <laughs> and <laughs> What an embarrassing bunch of fucking idiots. Sorry.
All right, don't get me wrong. I know this is 98 and Lennox was still not on the cusp of what he would end up doing. Like, you know, and just straight up dominating. The, and they just sold to Turkey, just ruined yeah. the magazine. Listen to this fucking idiot fucking list they had in 98, you guys. God. Well, th that being said, there is no way, even back in 98, that you could have Lennox below a guy like, and I love Cleveland Williams, but like, you know, a guy below him or something like that. You know what I mean? It just... It's unfathomable, but it's crazy to think that in only five years' time, now he's in almost everybody's consensus top five pound for pound, or not, no, top five all time heavyweights, you know? So. Jesus Christ, dude. What an embarrassing, you know, and we're, I don't want to get too far into it, but yeah, that's, that's what's hilarious about this whole thing, whether people are lamenting it's the end of an era with, with the ring selling to, uh, Turkey I'll shake or or whatever entity it's getting sold to I don't know don't really care but bro it's been kind of laughable for a long time and a lot of the people and this pertains to the show because a lot of it's history based uh, a lot of the people who have been on the kind of list making and history type of shit for decades now are really the kinds of people who have bought into this idea of that every fighter is a beloved warrior who cannot be touched because they've stepped into the ring and it's fucking, they're the greatest people on earth. Mm -hmm. Can't mm -hmm. do any wrong. It's poetic. They love it and all sorts of shit like that. And then on top of that, they're just buying this type of shit that other writers, because they grew up on reading Hemingway or they grew up on reading all these fucking other writers who were, you know, the greatest writers on Earth, Mailer and shit like that, the greatest writers in the world who also wrote about boxing because they wrote that way and they wrote about these fighters and they wrote about the, you know, some of, like, for instance, even some of the heavyweights from the 1930s who we have video of now and totally fucking sucked, like on video sucked. And then on top of that, we're inconsistent in the ring and where people are just like, oh my God, James Braddock. God, he's like top 10. It's like, the fuck, dude? And But that's what I'm saying is that like, you know, it, like the writers are doing that kind of shit and they're just taking that for what it is because some writer fucking back in the day was like the Cinderella man. He was so great. But those, this is the kind of shit that is that was still going on well into the 90s because these guys were holding on to that type of crap. So anyway, the idea that people are getting mad that like the ring is now like, bro, this shit got lost decades ago. Stop it. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Know. Had to go on that rant. Couldn't help it. It's totally fine. I don't even know where they're going to go with the magazine. Apparently there's a rumor we might go back to being printed again. Um, I don't, I don't know. I'm just Be printed yeah, on the souls of the it. fucking people. To... <laughs> yeah, seriously. Fucking Saudi regime, but whatever. All right, next one. I got a couple. I was thinking I'll just kind of lump them together because they both um are related to like eye injury comebacks and stuff, right? So two of my favorite fighters growing up were Julian Jackson, just because he would knock the I mean, by the time I became a boxing fan, I'm not gonna say I was a massive Jackson fan because by the time I became a fan, Jackson was already kind of on the back nine, right? Sure, sure, yeah. He was you know, he had already um I think the first time I saw him. It was him getting knocked the fuck out by Gerald McClellan in one round. That was the first time I watched him live. So that didn't help. And then um, the next time I saw him, though, is when he knocked out Augustino uh, Cardamone, you know, to regain the title. And clearly you could see Jackson was shot, but like he was getting his ass whooped in that fight and just came back to knock him out like the second round. But um, the fight I was going to mention, though, speaking of eye stuff, would be his first fight, his first fight, his only fight, uh, his fight with um, Harold Graham. Cause that is an inspirational fight when you think about it. Like he was getting the shit kicked out of him in that fight. Like it was not competitive. I watched it. I've been on a Harold Graham kick recently, like not watching all of his career, but just, you know, certain fights of his and trying to like gauge certain things. So I was reading about it. And I'm like, ah, oh, you know, let me go back and watch a few of his fights again. And I mean, the dude was absolutely brilliant. I, I mean, the worst pain in the ass you could possibly imagine the fight and just like ridiculous. And one of those dudes that probably better when it comes head to head, better than Eubank and better than Ben. And Eubank actually admitted that. He said that he avoided him like the plague because they sparred one time and Graham made him look like shit. And then Ben also too, I think he knew better than really go in there and get frustrated by a guy like that. And Graham had one of those long careers, you know, that 
started in the early 80s and he accumulated a ton of like European titles and Commonwealth and this and that, but couldn't entice any of the big names to get in the ring with him because, well, why would you? You know what I mean? At the time when Graham was already a ranked contender and looking on the verge of a title shot, Hagler was still a uh, champion. And there was people out there, oh, you know, I think Hagler was avoiding Harold Graham. What the? No, he Hagler never avoided anybody. Thing is, by the time Graham was positioning himself for a potential shot around 1987 or so, Hagler was just looking for big fights at that point. He was looking for a big fight with Leonard. He was looking for a big fight, maybe a rematch with Hearns. He was not looking to make another mandatory challenge with a guy like Harold Graham. That was going to obviously give him some trouble. Just, you know what I mean? At that point, too, he can, he had the right to pick and choose whatever fights he was going to do. So there's that, you know. Mike McCallum's got a much better case than Harold Graham, exactly. unfortunately. <laughs> so McCallum, for that matter, by the time he finally matches up, well, it didn't help his cause, too. They lost to Sumbu Callum Bay. By the time he fights McCallum, though, and that's one of those fights, again, heartbreaking decision. Like, he made McCallum look really bad. McCallum had to chase him around the ring a lot to, like, do it. And to his credit, he did. He was landing on him. But, I mean, like, he was – Graham made him look bad. It was a really tough fight. But, like, if it wasn't for one of those last rounds where Graham got penalized a point for spinning him or something ridiculous like that, McCallum might have lost. But that being said, by the time he gets his second title shot in 1990 – um, a number of years after he's been pro, he gets it against Julian Jackson. And Jackson, who had been junior middleweight champion at this point, moves up. And um, obviously a devastating puncher, you know, a guy that would like reign terror on the junior middleweight division. But there was like questions about, you know, his eyes, obviously, because I know he had a detached retina at that point, right? That he, that he had to get like fixed. And his chin was in the question too, because he had been hurt by certain guys. And obviously Mike McCallum had knocked him out. But what happened that night in where was it? Was it in Spain that they fought? I think it was in Spain they fought, right? Yeah, like some somewhat random, some, like, at, at least as far like, as I'm concerned, a random ass Benal Madena, which is a fucking never heard of it before even knowing oh, about this fight. But yeah, some random ass place in Spain. Yeah, it looked like a small casino room or something, you know what I mean? And really intimate setting. Like you could hear everything going on around you. Was you can only it almost seemed like it'd be standing room only. That being said. Graham was putting on a brilliant performance. I mean, like, he was all systems were a go. And a guy like Jackson, who we've said one of the greatest punches of all time, but a guy that's kind of methodical as well. There's not, like, a lot of fluidity to his to his game. And if you could take his shot, if you could take a shit, which most people couldn't, but, I mean, you know, he could be outboxed and stuff like that. So Graham's style was just an absolute night, you know, kryptonite for him. He was slower than him, more ponderous, and Graham was just doing what he wanted. First three rounds, just bing, 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 you know, beating him up. And also, too, you know, there's the there's the notion that Graham was just more of a slapper, which is true. He can be a slapper, but he did have power on his punches. Like, he stopped a lot of guys. And it wasn't just, like, stopping them on cuts. Like, he could drop guys and hurt them and all that. And he was hurting Jackson a little bit. Like, Jackson's face was getting marked up early on. He couldn't land any punches. And Graham was, like, making this look like a sparring session at some points. And so, after at round four... It was round four where they tell him, they were like, yo, like, we're giving you this last round. If you don't do something, that's going to be it because you're getting your ass whooped and nothing better is getting your eye. And his eyes were getting bad. That was the main thing is that his eyes were swollen up. One of his eyes was almost swollen shut. And the other one was, like, really damaged. And he just wasn't blocking it. So as Graham was coming in, he landed a combination. And Jackson was hurt from that. And he ran to the ropes. And Graham was going in to finish it off, which the referee would probably would have jumped in. Jackson comes over, you know, that's the one thing he always had is that he just knew how to throw a fastball if necessary. Um, Graham came in and Jackson threw one of the best punches in boxing history. And then that intimate setting, it sounded like a grand slam. You know what I mean? Just that smack. Up. And it was so just bad timing from Graham walking in like that with his guard down, thinking that he could do something or get the kill shot or whatever and just walked into the nastiest fucking right hand. And on top of that was the angle was just all wrong for him. Yeah. And it just was like knocked his ass back. You know what I mean? Just folded him backward and he was asleep straight up snoring. Oh no. <laughs> the British call where you're just like, Oh man, these fools, they were so cl He was so close too. he. And that's man. He was so close to becoming a world champion and that's the Harold Graham just had such a hard luck career in that regard where he, he, he came so fucking close and easily considered, you know, one of the greatest British fighters to never become world champion. 
I mean, it's a vicious, it's a nasty knockout. And Graham said that his life completely changed after that fight for a number of reasons. Like he attributes a lot of his subsequent, like, you know, mental issues that he's had and other stuff from that fight, from that one punch, because I mean, it was, it's nasty. Not only did he get hit with that and he was completely unconscious, but he got hit with that is that his head bounces off the canvas violently after too, because like you said, Nate, Pat, the angle he gets hit by, like he was coming in for he was leaning like that, and Jackson hits him like that, so he just falls back without, like, any type of... And just smacks his head so hard off the canvas that you just see, like, the way his chest is heaving up and down is crazy, just... <gasps> and, like, his whole body is in shock and trying to, like, deal with, you know, being short-circuited the way it was at that moment. Yeah, man, it was, it was a real bad knockout, the kind of knockout that usually makes you know, craziest knockout compilation type of things. And it did. That went on almost everybody's knockout compilation. It made like it's top. And that showed, you know, the saving power of a guy like Jackson that like what, what his power meant, what his power means because a career full of nasty knockouts. That's one of yeah. his nastiest, you know, it probably is his nastiest when you think about it, considering the circumstances of what goes on behind him, how badly he was losing. And he was on the verge of being stopped. Like he has some other ridiculous knockouts where you just leave guy, you know, he's, made de made guys you know lose uh leave the consciousness of the earth clearly but he was already overpowering them immediately like you know um like uh what's it negron negron that he fought mm -hmm. there um or uh fuck there's so many different dudes he just knocked the absolute hell out of back one, in the one of the worst ones and maybe one of the ones that you're thinking of that a lot of people were the dudes just like into the camera yeah. that's wayne yeah. powell yeah. Wayne Powell, that's the one, yeah. Where it's yeah. like, he's just like on the canvas, like, mm -hmm. yeah, that's the Wayne Powell knockout where it's like, you're like, okay, camera guy, stop, please <laughs> yeah. stop. And he's staring ahead, is just like slight smiling like Ricky Hatton did against Pacquiao. He's just, hey. Jesus Christ. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was, I mean, it was an absolutely ridiculous knockout. And then. Jackson, you know, would go on to have a pretty good reign as WBC middleweight champion. Graham's career never, never recovered from that fully. Like, he he retired soon after that fight. He had a few more fights. He lost to Callum Bay again, I think, got stopped one more time. But he had an improbable comeback in the late 90s, which was successful initially because no one anticipated it. He came back around the age of 38 or uh, 39 or so, and then he knocked out um, Chris Johnson, the Olympian who we mentioned that fought Antonio Tarver, but he dominated him and stopped him, which was a big upset. And then after that, he fought Vinny Pazienza for um, an infamous fight for a number of reasons. One for the poster that they had for it, um, where Graham was dressed as an uh, an angel and completely butt naked. Yeah, except for some reason naked, yeah. Completely naked and having boxing gloves covering his um, insides. And then... Uh, Paz, and Paz has got like the heads. Yeah, he's holding severed heads of like women and stuff like that. While he's yeah, like, why women? Why? What are you doing? The fuck? Strange as fuck. I have no idea how that even why that came up. Why that? That, be and, that and then like the cat eyes poster. Like there were some very very unique and interesting posters from the UK in the late nineties. I wonder what was going on in that lager back then. <laughs> but oh um, shit. You know, the Graham then, his last fight was against Charles Brewer, which was on the undercard of Lennox Lewis against uh, Shannon Briggs. And when I was a kid, that fight was supposed to be on HBO. That's how it was. That's how it was actually published as initially that that was going to be aired on HBO. And I was excited because I was a Brewer guy and I was finally going to be able to watch him without going to bed early because Brewer usually fought on Tuesday night fights and stuff. You know, very rarely did he fight on a Saturday or whatever yeah, it was. Good was Philly like, oh. super middleweight. Yeah, so I was like, man, I get to watch Brewer, and he's going to fight Harold Graham, because I had read about Graham at this point, you know, and knew he was making a comeback. I was like, I get to see him. And when HBO starts airing, I'm like, oh, great, great, great. And they go, of course, it's like pre-internet when you don't find out what's going to be the one fight in our right? Oh, tonight we're just going to be showing Lennox Lewis and Shannon Briggs, and I'm just like, really? <laughs> and then come to find out it was a compelling fight where Graham dropped Brewer twice, was outboxing him, turned the clock back, it was making him look really bad in sports before Brewer finally just like woke the fuck up and beat his ass in round 10 and made him, you know, stopped him. And I'm like, you made me miss this? Really? It took years before I was able to watch it on YouTube. But And Brewer could crack too. So, I mean, not exactly a fucking like, you know, astonishing uh, outcome per se. But that being said, yeah, dude, it was a fucking, 
not exactly a war, but definitely a compelling fight. And that knockout was like out of the blue too. Like Graham was still ahead and all he had to do was last on his feet a couple of more rounds. And then Brewer just came in with run right hand and Graham's legs went a little, you know, jelly, like moved to the ropes and Brewer was like, fuck this. And just ran over and yeah, landed. He swarmed him. Yeah. Swarmed him. And poor, I don't know who the referee was. It might've been Rudy battle at one of those dudes, but like, he grabs him and Graham subsequently ref grabbed the referee's legs, like almost, you know, and I even realized what was going on. Like he was gone. It was gone. But it was sad to watch too because you had, you did feel kind of bad for him. Like he was that close to finally winning a title and then it got snatched away again. But um, the other one that I would bring up, because this is one of my favorite fighters, definitely grown up, and I was able to watch a lot of his career, was Kevin Kelly against Derek Gaynor in their first fight. That's a good call and especially a, a bit of a. Anybody who was subjected to having having to put up with Derek Gaynor because you watched a Roy Jones card several times, you you were happy at least. To say, I mean, not by then because it was it hadn't quite happened yet by the Kevin Kelly fight. It was kind of after that. But that being said, even so, you could go back and watch that fight and say, ah, all right. Because, man, Derek Gaynor was – talk about frustrating to watch, dude. Just a guy who I don't know why he was a fighter because he really, really seemed to hate getting hit. Like he didn't like getting hit. And he was tall and he was lanky and he was a southpaw and he just knew just how to make serious pain in the ass. And he never got and he never got stripped like that again. As far well, Corrales kind of did, but not to the same extent. You know what I mean? But like, yeah, it was well. That was the one fight where Gainer actually looked exciting. I think that's what subsequently HBO kept on bringing him back for was because the excitement of that fight. If he had stunk it out and just ran around and you know slapped him up for ten rounds, I mean HBO probably would have brought him back because of the influence. Roy Jones, hey man, you better put him on my undercard. I don't give a fuck. And they'd be like, eh, fine, I guess. But like, you know, it was the excitement of it. Like that was a great fight. A really great fight, and that you know mainly because like Gainer came out really aggressive, trying to make a statement to knock Kelly out. It wasn't so much you know Kelly looked slower; he was like kind of definitely slower than Gainer. He was smaller than him and long, you know, shorter reach. And Gainer came out just peppering him immediately in the fight, just ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, and, like landing some really good shots on him. And Kelly, who has always been notorious for eye issues in terms of like them swelling up and puffiness and all that, immediately started you know having issues. And it got to the point where, like, I forgot what round it was, but that eye got, like, really, really nasty, where it was, like, swelling up badly. But that being said, Kelly also had dropped Gainer, too, at one point during that fight, like, early on. Gainer got a little too overzealous, so, like, it was going back and forth. <clears throat> yeah, it it actually was, I think, uh, a bit of a, like, kind of an unexpected war or whatever. And Derek Gainer, man, like I said, he had such, like, a strange career uh, he had lost a few times going into that fight, but he had kind of righted the ship a little bit and he was kind of floating in and out of the rankings by that point. But uh, Kevin Kelly, real popular guy in the New York scene, good puncher. Uh, I'm pretty sure he had a pretty good amateur pedigree. I think he won the Golden Gloves. Uh, you know, just a, a guy that everybody in uh, everybody in New York knew. But... You know, this, this was kind of like a crossroads fight or whatever. And it wound up kind of just unfolding in a way that was far more violent than anybody expected. Well, a thousand percent. The thing is that, like, Kelly was being built initially as, like, a star for HBO. You know, he was undefeated. He had beaten Goyo Vargas for a title. Like you said, the New York connection. And he had the gift of gab. Like, he was, a, he, he was an exciting fighter who made for good fights because he could get dropped and stuff. But... He was undefeated. He, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but had they already pulled him in to do commentating by that time? Mm, no, I don't think so. Okay. I think his first gig as a commentator for HBO was KO Nation. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that was his first gig as a commentator was KO Nation. So that was what, like 99, 2000? Yeah. yeah. Um. So when he got to HBO, that was one of the first low weight fighters they like really invested in. You know, like HBO was notorious back then for not really airing, you know, lower weight fighters. And Kelly was one was supposed to be like one of those guys that they were going to start airing that they would, you know, build toward like, you know, like him and build toward like fights with him, possibly like McKinney or this, you know, other Tom, uh, any of the guys around that time. Right. You know what I mean? But Kelly was going to be a staple for them and him losing the way he did to Alejandro Gonzalez. An excellent, excellent fight. Great fight, in fact. But still, he gets stopped in that. And then. 
and his subsequent fights after that doesn't look really great. That's the problem is that Kelly just he didn't look like a great fighter after the after the um after the Alejandro Gonzalez fight. Like that was an incredible fight. Like, you know, Kelly was getting beat up and his eyes were getting really swollen. But at one point he dropped Gonzalez and it looked like he was going to rally to make a comeback. And then Gonzalez, you know, finally stopped him because Kelly literally couldn't see out of either eye. But he struggled in fights where like he had a draw with Bones Adams in a fight that no one should ever watch because it was fucking horrendous. Um, God, Bones Adams was one of those guys who was just poison, dude. Sure. And, you know, I mean, there was other dudes too. I have to like look up. Um, See, it was all right. So there was, yeah, Bones Adams, a fight with Tommy Parks, not the, not the trainer, obviously, where that was just like a weird technical decision. A uh, fight with Ricardo Rivera, where Kelly was getting beat up and almost on the verge of being stopped before coming back to win that one. So, you know, and then beating a, a clearly faded Louis Espinosa. So, I mean, like at that point, HBO wasn't trying to bring back a guy like that or use him, you know, he like he had already lost a, the chance of him being like a staple of that of um of their network because of that. So when he came back, they finally came back to have him fight Derek Gaynor. Yeah, that was the fight because I'm sure Roy Jones insisted they put, you know, a guy like Gaynor on their undercard. And since Kelly is still a big name, that made sense that they would match him with Kelly. That isn't that's that's, you know, that is a good fight. But Gaynor for his first time on HBO, like you said, he was in, it was in Jacksonville. So this is his hometown. You know, he's back home in, in Florida and he's going in there and he's beating the shit out of Kelly. But it was like a back and forth until Kelly's eyes started going. And I think it was that's when he went down the first time Kelly did in that fight is because like he got hit with something and he turned his back and went to a knee and Gaynor hit him a couple of more times. And you see Kelly like grab his face. And when he lets it out, you see his eye and everyone's just kind of like, oh, shit, because his eye looked like, um, Rocky Balboa's, you know, cut me, Mick. That's it basically looked like that. Completely swollen, engorged with blood on the inside of it, and just like nothing. So the type I'm, of shit that would probably get stopped these days. A thousand percent it would get stopped. And at that point, it was on the verge of being stopped too. Like they were almost gonna give Kelly like one or two more rounds. And you can't get hit in the eye so many more times, it's gonna cause permanent damage. But that being said, as they went in that, what was it, like round eight, I think it was, Kelly just comes over and lands that miracle left hand. They were both throwing shots, and Gaynor, and Kelly just got there first. And Gaynor, with the momentum of him coming in, walked right into him. Ow. Head just knocked around like a swivel. Unconscious. And and for all the shit that I was talking about, Derek Gaynor, too, I mean, he got dinged around quite a bit by a number of different fighters, but it was only one other time that he got stopped, and that was against Juan Manuel Marquez. Or actually, that was no, I'm sorry, that was a technical decision. Let me rephrase that. Corrales knocked him out. Yeah, that was right. That was yeah, that's right. That was Corrales, not Marquez. And but I mean, Marquez was all over his ass. But uh, you know, getting knocked out by a good puncher like Kevin Kelly and a very good puncher by Diego, like Diego Corrales, not necessarily any shame in that. But yeah, it was just that this was kind of like um, Roy Jones had already put Derek Gaynor on the undercard of the James Tony fight, and Derek Gaynor lost to Roberto Garcia, who's the trainer now, and uh, so that was kind of like supposed to be a bit of a coming out party for Derek Gaynor on the undercard of a big fight, and he lost. He lost by decision, got beaten up a little bit, and then on top of that, you know, bringing him out here is kind of like all right. Roy Jones probably had some say in it, putting him on the card here, and he wound up getting knocked out, sparked out by uh, Kevin Kelly. And so, I mean, you know, it wouldn't be the last time that he did it too. But yeah, man, that's a, that's a really good call, especially because Kevin Kelly, uh, this win set him up for, you know, certainly his biggest fight against Nassim Hamed. He got a few more wins, but that fight definitely propelled him toward that direction sure and it gave kelly a bunch more hbo dates on top of that just like keeping relevant you know what i mean exactly. he, had, he had this fight he ended up being one of the early entries on boxing after dark where he laid an absolute egg against edwin edwin santana i think yep. the guy guy from connecticut um not a good fight not one of the good fights of the early days of boxing after dark and like you said the hamed fight definitely catapulted him as well into like the you know in terms of like popularity of like big fights and all that but that was basically the the Hamed fight was like the height of his um of everything for him he never really recovered from that and his career never really recovered from that like after the Hamed fight like that was the height of it you know there was opportunities for him 
where I remember one time reading uh, that there was supposed to be a doubleheader on HBO where Hamed was supposed to fight Kennedy McKinney. And I could see that. That was a big fight to be made back then. McKinney had just knocked out Junior Jones, Hamed, you know, whatever. I could see that fight being made. The fight, I don't understand that they planned on making, aside from them just being bloods and guts warriors, but just like the size difference would have been absolutely absurd, was that they were planning on making on the undercard Gotti against Kevin Kelly. Yeah. That was the fight they had planned, yeah. <laughs> and you're shaking your head like, I mean, Kelly had, no, no, no. <laughs> Yikes, dude. Jesus Christ. They already did Joey Gamash fucking dirty with the, with the <laughs> weight difference. Good gravy, man. But PR. And this would have been like around 1998-ish or so after like Kelly had already lost to Derek Gaynor in a rematch and all this stuff. Like, why would they do that to him? God, he was on like a rampage. He would have absolutely obliterated Kelly badly, like... You know, and I love Kelly. It just wouldn't have ended well for him. He was just no, too small to deal with yeah, the guy. No. Yeah. Not the right size at all. And yeah, dude, I mean, uh, Kelly had that pedigree or whatever, but he did not have the size for that shit, no question. And I mean, you know, he wound up uh, rematching Derek Gaynor, uh, you know, a little bit later, a couple years, about two years later, and losing the decision. So Derek Gaynor at least wound up getting some measure of revenge. But like you said, Kevin Kelly, his career was never really the same after that and then wound up just being fodder for Eric Morales a couple of years after that. Um, and then Marco Antonio Barrera after that. Mm -hmm. And that was an HBO pay-per-view. Why was that on pay-per-view? Like that was watch Kevin Kelly against Barrera on pay-per-view. I don't know if they lost enough money on the budget that they had to put it on pay-per-view. If that's the case, do some independent thing or something. But, you know, Kelly... He la his career lasted a long time, longer than actually I actually remembered it did, you know. And because I forgot that he fought Manuel Medina in two thousand six, of all people, <laughs> and lost yeah, that fight. Fought Bobby Pacquiao, Mister Blow. Blow. Uh, mm -hmm. He beat Carlos Hernandez, which was probably was, was good for him for him. But his best win, actually, and a very underrated win for him, uh, was against Humberto Soto, which I didn't even realize he beat. Yeah, dude, Humberto Soto, man, what a yeah. Jesus Christ. That's a that's really a good name. Name, looking back on it. Yeah, that's a name. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, dude. You know, uh th those are some good calls, dude, because coming back from uh, you know, I shit is pretty harrowing. It's the type of thing that we saw Ray Leonard have to do uh, you know, in a couple fights. Um, and especially a couple kind of like, you know, uh unsung type of fights against kind of unsung type of guys where you, we he got his eye messed up and stuff like that. Um, no question. Those are a couple of good entries. I say probably gonna have to close it out here. However, mm -hmm. I did want to mention one fight, and it's it's probably good to mention it toward the end here because everybody knows this fight, everybody knows the history. There's no point in going into the fucking major thing. However, the the anniversary was recently, and that's Muhammad Ali over George Foreman. That's got to be, I mean, Muhammad Ali probably has like four different entries on this list for like inspirational victories and shit like that. You know, you got the, obviously the rubber match between him and Joe Frazier, the first Sonny Liston fight uh, and George Foreman fight. Those three alone are probably plenty, but against George Foreman, I think that it was that one last massive hurrah, of course, against Leon Spinks regaining the title. That was big too, no question. But I think the fact that it was Leon Spinks, all due respect, made it not nearly as big as... Leave Leon Spinks. alone, bro. I'm sorry, Leon. Rest in peace, bro. But, My boy. <laughs> you know, it's just... It's okay, yeah. Hey, man, George Foreman was a monster. Obviously, we have a lot of fucking hindsight now, and I understand that. And there was a lot of glaring flaws and everything, blah, blah, blah. But people thought George Foreman was going to work him for a reason because Muhammad Ali had already had a long ass career had already been thought of as, you know, pretty much done wound up pulling it out, becoming champion again, massive, mm -hmm. massive shit. I mean, it's one of those fights. Like, of course, with the anniversary being this past week or was it this past week? Well, last yeah. week ish. -ish. Wait, yeah. yeah we, you know, it was a couple of weeks ago, whatever it was, but the fact that it's been 50 years, even Don King came out of his cave to to make um, a statement about it, <laughs> um, among other things. he um, A clearly pre-written statement that he had to read from. Yeah. 
and then you know make it a plea to, to meet with turkey and then but after that um you know it's one of the it was just an it's an incredible event i i mentioned this that you and i should do our just our own podcast talking about the show and you know talking about it one day like the entire event of it because it's just it's it's incredible you know the fact of how don king in his first, I mean, you got to give him credit for as much of a scumbag as he is. Like, he was able to pull this together. He fucked a lot of people over doing it, including his best friend Lloyd Price and a number of others. But he was the only person that was able to bring something like that, you know, to, to bring all these worlds together as he did. I mean, he certainly needed help, but it was became a crazy event. And one that had so many wild hurdles, too. Like, you know, the fact that it's being held in Zaire, Africa, all right? Like, well, a guy like Mobutu, who a crazy tyrant who kill anybody that even looked at him the wrong way or demanded that type of stuff. And they had to get the money for that. They had to bring this in. Don King had to provide certain amounts of money for, um, Ali and Foreman to be able to, to entice them to go out there to do that. Um, Lloyd Price using his connections to, to make a giant concert out of it. Right. You know, which was an incredible, it's incredible concert and a documentary. I think they made it in itself because you had guys like spinners and James Brown and, um, Celia Cruz and so many other top notch names that made appearances for Baby King. Baby yeah. King, yeah. I mean, it's a, I, I had the soundtrack, man. That shit is awesome. That's a, that concert sounded incredible. There's a there's a video clip if anyone ever wants to watch it of Celia Cruz performing out there with her with our orchestra and bruh. It's I'm sure so she good. tore it down. Tore it the fuck up, man. I forgot the dude who was the who was the um the conductor of the orchestra, but he was cutting a rug up in there too. <laughs> like my man was going in. It was I mean African inspired music, dog. You know, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, see, I'm over thinking about it like dancing. That shit was awesome. <laughs> but what I mean by the hurdles, like, think, think about this. The fight was initially supposed to happen in September of that year of uh 74. Foreman goes out there and Immediately, unlike Ali, who just integrated himself with the audience and made everybody feel good and yeah, blah, 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 all this bullshit, um, Foreman was the exact opposite. You know, Foreman was mean and surly as he always. This was like the height of his surliness, by the way. And plus, he's going to a foreign country where he doesn't really want to like fuck with people, and so he's really keeping to himself. And on top of that, which really made everyone just absolutely love him, and I say that sarcastically, he goes over and brings German shepherds along with him. Which were like the dogs that were known for that that the police carried around back then that attacked all the civilians that they hated. So like yeah, he he bred German shepherds. Yeah, and so he would yeah he'd have like German shepherds and shit with them and and yeah they, that just made the locals love him even more. They just you know they absolutely adored him for that. <laughs> and but it was it was crazy. I mean, like I said, one day we have to do a podcast talking about this whole thing how it comes together because there's so many different stories stories to it. But the actual fight. Everybody was worried about Ali in that fight. No one thought really gave him a chance. There were a few people out there, like um, Larry Merchant, for instance, and a few others who who knew they were just like Ali can win this fight. And like you know, if he is he, if he's able to ride through the storm, he does have the work you know to be able to do this. But the majority of the people who had watched him just bounce around Joe Frazier and George Foreman, uh, Joe Frazier and Ken Norton, like they were just mere basketballs. We're fearing for Ali's life. I mean, like, you know, how is a guy who's a dancing master but can't dance around like that, move around for 15 rounds against an absolute man, you know, a Bigfoot like that? It just made no sense. No one could. And Ali never had one punch knockout power either. Not like Frazier, not like these guys. How is he going to keep forming off of him? You know, it just didn't make any sense to think that this was going to happen. And people couldn't compute that shit. It, and, you know, it makes sense too because it's not like. I think that the idea and the hindsight that we have now where people are like, oh, well, when you look at it, you know, it was the perfect timing and shit like that. And I guess there's obviously there's something to that. But at the same time, Ali did have to Ali did have to fucking uh, rise to the occasion. He did have to take some punishment, a pretty good amount of punishment. I mean, if you look at him uh, addressing the press after that and shit, dude, he's beaten up. His eyes are bruised. Uh, you know, he he said that his body was fucking sore as fuck from taking a beating, and that if he weren't in the shape that he was in, that he wouldn't have been able to last even to round eight to get that knockout. And that you know, I mean, it makes sense. George Foreman was working; he was putting in a lot of work, and that's why he was so exhausted. But that's also all of the history around it, all of the you know, everything that made that fight and that event, what it was, you know, you bring up the concert and the, the, 
concert that was meant to be basically the promotional leg of the fight, you know, was some of the world's biggest musical acts. That's fucking, that just tells you right there that how crazy it was that these people who were opening and, you know, doing concerts on their own were opening for Muhammad Ali. It's crazy. You know I want to say too, I think what made the public's perception that Ali couldn't handle, would lose the foreman is because no one had really seen, I mean, like the, the public had seen Ali taking a beating already, right? Like they seen him get dropped by Frazier and get beat up in that fight and lose it. And they seen him get, you know, his jaw broken by Norton kind of beat up in that. But that was Frazier and Norton. And even though Frazier's one of the hardest hitters in boxing history and an absolute animal, and Norton, you know, was a bruiser in himself, they weren't Foreman. Like, Foreman had just made them look like nothing. You know what I mean? Like, just like little kids. And so the public's perception is that if those dudes were able to beat up Ali and Ali coming back, you know, for out of the, out of the, the retirement that he did, and he's not the dancing master he once was because no one knew he can just lean back and take that type of shit. Like, he had taken punishment from Frazier and Norton, but, like, no one knew he could take something like yeah, that. From they Foreman. assumed that he was going to have to fight with them or something. Yeah, because everyone's like, well, he can't dance around forever. Foreman's going to cut the ring off, which he could because he was ridiculously good at that. And he was going to, you know, bang him around. And Ali's going to just drop and crawl out of there. But the fact that I think everyone was just astonished by was the way Ali just did it. He was able to, I mean, those ropes were looser, right? And so he was able to use that to his advantage and lean back and, like, take off some of the sting on that shit. But Foreman was hitting him and hitting him and hitting him. I mean... You know, by round eight, you can see the sloppiness, but he was still, you know, round seven, Foreman had a really good round, I think it was, right? Like, he just outworked Ali. He was in there, and he's just chugging and chugging and churning and everything. Like, he just didn't stop. It looked like him hitting the heavy bag. You know, when Foreman was just... Dur, 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 yeah, there dur. were sequences where Ali really wasn't doing much. Like, he was yeah. talking to him, and he's, like, slip sliding and shit, but he wasn't really doing much, you know, offensively. Was like, Foreman was working him and working him. And so everyone's just like, my God. And that's why An Angelo Dundee is basically having an aneurysm in the corner. Like, what the fuck? Get off the rope. Stop this. Stop this fight. Like, what are you doing? And he's like, I got it. I got it. And he did. And I mean, you know, the the the, the finishing sequence, too, is like, it's so dramatic, but it's also hilarious because of Foreman's face. You know what I mean? Like, And it just and happens so, out of nowhere. It does. It really happens out of nowhere. Foreman's still churning. Ali hits him with a quick combination. Bing, bing. Right? And the crowd goes a little crazy, but then... Foreman leans in a little bit. Ali hits him with another right hand. That's when Foreman starts leaning over the rope. So Ali like hits him one more time, and then it happens so suddenly. Hits him and and like um uh the dearly departed there, who's our, our buddy Bob Sheridan. You can hear in his voice too. Ali hits him with a right and another and another. And another, and another, and another and goes down like you know it just like, it's so quick. And the thing is, but like hits him boom boom, and then Ali to his credit jumps with him as he does it because he's still you know. And he hits him when he hits him with that last right hand. You see Foreman's face as he's just like, and he flails. He's just like, oh god, you know, it's a, it's a funny but dramatic. It's a dramatic but hilarious knock, you know, knockout the way it is because he does and he just drops. And when he drops and how he gets up and then he just walks. You know what I'm saying? That's the most dramatic part. He gets counted out and he just gets up and just walks to to, to the corner, and walks out of the ring, like just done, defeated, everything, just gone. You know. Well, I mean, to to be just fucking have so quickly, like, you know, you're beating the crap out of this guy. And then all of a sudden he just goes pop and hits you like three times and you're fucking done. I would imagine that would definitely take it out of you. Sure. I mean, <laughs> you know, that was one of the, uh, and Ali always said to not only was that like one of the most dramatic victories and inspirational victories in boxing history. Ali always said that was his favorite. That was his best one because he said it too. He was like, I regained my title. I did it in Africa in front of my people. Like, you know. And that the way, you know, the fight ends and the whole crowd, everybody just roars in there. And there's Ali in the middle of a champion of the world again. It's just it's incredible, man. Like, imagine I always say, like, we weren't alive back then. I came a decade. You came eight years later. But like, if we were alive for that moment, watching that on television, like I can't even like we would have been going crazy. Yeah, all like, I probably would have been like crying, dude. Yeah. I would have been like, oh, my God. Yeah, it's just. That's how I felt. That was our moment for that was Foreman Moore watching that live. You know what I mean? Watching that unfold live. Pretty much. Um, or for me, if I, one of the chance I got to watch something live, a moment like that for me, the one I got to see live would be a Ruiz Joshua one watching that unfold, you know, like seeing the dramatics of that happen was absolutely insane. Um, yeah, that was pretty wild. Yeah. That was an inspirational victory in itself. Seeing, you know, 
Ruiz get dropped. And I'm like, all right, this is going to be early night at the office. All of a sudden, I'm getting over there. He's just, and I'm like, oh, shit. No. And then, like, me and Bob, it's just kind of like. <laughs> and then, yeah. You, yeah, it was, man. But that had to be one, bro. Of course, like, Ali, like you said, had a men incredible inspirational victories, you know, including his very last one against Leon Spinks, where it gives you that memorable part where he's being held up and he goes like this, you know. Kisses the audience and stuff like that, almost like his farewell to them. And it should have been. That should have been it. That just should have been it. Because it, uh, you know, but the world just had how other boxing players. goes, dude. Yeah, man. But I feel like that's a pretty good, I, I feel like that's a pretty good list of inspirational victories, though. Yeah, you can't, you can't, I mean, if you want to, like, there's others like that you can just, like, kind of throw out there for, like, easy names, like, um, Jake Lamada's last round knockout of Laurent Dathaliu. Larry That's a Holmes, good one, yeah. Larry Holmes winning against Ken Norton because you got to think about how he tore his rotator cuff before the fight and still had to go 15 rounds of absolute hell while using his jab throughout the fight to beat to you know to beat Norton. Like that's a good one. Um Archie Moore against Yuvon Durrell in their first fight when Moore was like fucking, what, 45 or something and getting dropped countless times and kept on getting up until he finally stopped him. I mean, these are the fights that unite fans together at least for an hour before we start hating each other again. Fucking, uh, I know it's definitely not quite on that level, but Danny Williams against Mark Potter, the one where he had oh, his fucking yeah. Yeah, his yeah, arm yeah. fucking yeah. like not working, you know? <laughs> his arm was like disabled and shit and he still fucking got the win with one arm. Obviously, um, Morales Castillo. Um, our boy, Dewey Bozella. <laughs> yeah. It was an inspirational story. I say it out of jest, but it was an inspirational story. It was. It was cool to see him make that pro debut and be able to do what he did. For sure. I, I'm Okay, I'm an asshole for making a joke out of that. It was not nah, You're good. You're good. Um, <laughs> the first Carbajal Chiquita Gonzalez fight. That's no, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, 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 for sure. Or like uh, Chiquita Gonzalez, no, or Shajatarong, Saman Shajatarong, Chiquita Gonzalez, you know, coming to California, getting his ass kicked, having his eye closed and scoring a dramatic knockout to finish Gonzalez's career. I mean. For sure. Yeah. And and that's still a name that people in boxing refuse to try to pronounce, Shajatarong, for sure. Or Fucking, I mean, um, it's kind of easy for, I don't want to say easy, but like we read about him enough coming up because he was, a, he ended up being a long-term champion. Like he wasn't just a flash in the pan who lost no, the belt. Yeah, he was a good fighter. He made like 10 or 12 defenses against really good fighters. And he was, you know, he was up until the late nineties. He was a good guy. Yeah, he's a good fighter. And uh, I don't, I didn't hear you mention it. I don't think, but uh, the uh, Marciano's rematch with Ezra Charles with his nose. Oh, I mean, dude, yeah. In yeah. in any other era after that, I don't think that fight would have been allowed to continue. But it was during the time, and I mean, that fool had a fucking. That's definitely oh. one of the craziest injuries I've seen go forward in a fight. Did they call that as a as a well? They called that as a punch, right? They I'm said that was sure. A and it wasn't. It was like an elbow or something, but it doesn't matter. They called it as a punch. I think so. Yeah, watching watching Martin, you know, before we go, just to say this, it was hilarious because you know how um, Marciano hosted his own show? You know, like... Uh, Get him, Archie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what was that? That He did that in the 60s or like the late 50s, 60s or whatever? Um, Gosh, I mean, I, I guess it probably... Sure. Gosh... Let me think it would have been then uh probably early 60s because it would have yeah. been after those fights happened obviously sure, but yeah. he wasn't like with all due respect rocky was looking extremely washed in the, his last few years of life and he wasn't quite there yet on the show but um you know he would he would bring in former champions that watch their fights and they would commentate their fights together but sometimes he would commentate his own fights and those were the good ones one time he commentated the charles rematch and the way he was talking, it was like, he's talking about the cut, right? He was like, my trainer says it's just a nick so far. I'm still just working the way it is. Everything okay, blah, blah, blah. Then he comes back to the corner. My trainer told me it's bad. He says he was lying to me. It was like something like that. He said, <laughs> he was like, he says, he was like, he needs to, he was like, he can't stop the blood. I'm freaking out now. I need to knock him out. <laughs> just, I don't know. It's funny. Like the commentary is really funny. Like the way he's just so matter of factly. He seemed like a pretty funny dude, to be yeah. honest. 
He was like, my trainer says it's bad. He says he was just trying to make me feel better earlier. He was like, I need to go now. Now I'm scared. He was like, Ezra's trying to move. I have to get this guy out of there. <laughs> I'm going to lose the title. They're doing it in the most Brockton accent. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I can't even. I'm from. I'm a born and raised Massachusetts person. My accent comes out once in a blue moon, but I can never have it as thorough as like Rocky Marciano's just... You know, yeah, that fool was the had the fucking Massachusetts mouth for sure. Yeah. But yeah, this was fun. Yeah, dude, for sure. Hey, you know, we talk a lot about uh dark shit. We talk a lot about really pessimistic and cynical and you know, boxing is a pessimistic and cynical sport a lot of the time when you're forced to confront the reality of it, unfortunately. So it's nice to step back every so often and despite the fact that, you know, a lot of the stuff that we talk about goes hand in hand with the icky stuff. Try to focus a little bit more on the inspirational and the motivational and the positive shit for once, for once, yeah. you know, totally. All right, man. Well, I appreciate it. Everybody who listened in, thank you so much. We appreciate you go ahead and uh, whatever podcast app you're using these days, subscribe to the show there, leave us a comment or a rating. That stuff is appreciated as far as YouTube. Thanks so much for watching. Subscribe, comment, et cetera. As far as social media goes, I'm not mentioning any of that shit anymore. Fuck that. Find us if you want to, bro. All right, Harris. We'll talk soon, brother. Have a good one, y'all.